Welcome to Eternal Journey, the podcast. What is up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Eternal Journey, the podcast that talks about all things eternal with a focus on limited play. I am your host, Jedi, and this week on the show, we have a quite a doozy for you. We have episode 36, the Flame of Zolta Common and Uncommon Set Review. That is right. I'm going to go down each card, card by card in the set, going over my own personal review of it and how I feel like it fits into the limited format. So to better help you guys make your picks and selections as you're going through the drafts. So of course I'm doing the legwork so you don't have to and hopefully you can reap the rewards. But first things first before we go into it, I want to mention the YouTube channel that is EJ the podcast or you can search Eternal Journey on the search bar. You should find me right there on YouTube. I upload all kinds of great videos to include constructive videos, draft videos, sealed uh, tournament reports whenever we start doing the new ECQ season, and even a couple of recent things to include the Content Creator Showdown, which is going to be a challenge show where I bring on various content creators of the eternal world and have them battle it out. Just showcasing their talent and expertise as well as entertainment value so you guys can check it out and spread the word about this great game of ours. And uh, one of the last things I upload are cube drafts. I just recently did the first one last week and upload the video. It's seen some quite a little bit of success. Cube drafting, for those of you that don't know, and I'll be very brief about it because this is going to be a long show, is drafting four curated packs of a set or format that I designed through the uh, using the cards of Eternal, it's still Eternal cards. So you draft and then you build a 75 card deck. We have to do 75 cards because we're unable to challenge each other with a 45 card down, 45 card decks. So we have to accommodate for that. So it is 75 card decks plus I incorporated 30 power or everyone is required to play 30 power to kind of balance that out one other thing i'd like to mention before we move on is the fact that all the packs there is no rarity restriction so you can easily open up a pack with 10 12 10 or 12 rares and legendaries in it but that's gonna do it if you're interested definitely check it out every sunday on my stream live i'm going to be doing that uh, until other until people tell me it's not popular but all right that's gonna do it guys uh, so let's go into our subscriber shout out section. So a couple of new subscribers. Thank you guys so much for subbing to the Twitch channel. Of course, that is twitch.tv slash Jedi underscore EJ. Thank you guys so, so much. I really appreciate it. I'm glad my entertainment value has gone up in your eyes. This is Lead to Gold, MLNTN, and Risper Visper. Thank you guys so, so much for the subs. I really do appreciate it. Hopefully you got your EJ badge. Hopefully you'll eventually work up to your lightsaber and the Darth Vader, which I haven't even gotten to yet. But thank you guys so, so much. Once again, led to gold, MLNTN, and Risper Visper. Of course, thank you to all my resubscribers. I really appreciate you guys very much so. Slowly but surely, we're building this great, great community of ours. So I really appreciate you guys. Uh, words cannot express it enough couple of people I want to give shout outs to for the bits this week is Circa Sparkles. She is a fellow streamer. Definitely check her out streaming early mornings. Fun, very entertaining. Definitely send some love her way. And then the Neil Tyson, a big enthusiast for the cube, which I appreciate. So I got some bits from that. So definitely appreciate that. Hope to see him at the draft this Sunday. Also want to take a moment to give a quick shout out to XI550 for trying to put together a draft simulator that can accommodate the cube format so we can now draft it individually instead of doing a duplicate draft format. He's doing this out of their own free time so I really do appreciate that and just wanted to give him a shout out once again XI550. Thank you so much for your efforts. And then lastly want to mention Electropilot for the raid today thank you so so much for that raid i really do appreciate it sharing the love with me and hopefully i'll be able to return the favor really kind guy definitely appreciate that so thank you fellow streamer definitely check him out at twitch.tv slash electropilot thank you guys so so much you all are great i really need to start coming up with more words for thank you to show my appreciation but you guys rock 
But all right, that is going to do it for our shout out section, which moves us into the final preemptive one, which oop, don't, don't, don't want to save that. I just wanted to minimize it. All right, we have our pack one pick one for the Flame of Zolta. That's right, guys. And I actually screenshotted this one because this was a doozy. Kind of a difficult one, to be completely honest with you. So starting off with the rare, we have Nivea, a 4-4, or Nivea Most Devoted. She's a 4-4 Paladin at rare for 4, Justice, Justice, Shadow, Shadow. So 2 green, 2 purple. When you decimate your power, your Paladins get a plus 1, plus 1. There are some Paladins in the set. Obviously, they are catered or focused around Arjunport. <clears throat> and Mastery 20, the enemy player loses all their maximum power. So pretty much a game ender ability there. I will say this though, if she manages to do 20 damage, I feel like you're already winning the game. At the uncommon level, we have Karyos' Choice. This is a fast spell at uncommon for two red gold. So fire time. You can choose from deal three damage to an enemy unit. Okay, solid. That that works. That's a conflagrate. Or put one of your units into your hand. So it saves one of your units from combat. Okay, I think they did a pretty good job on this. They slapped torch and um, was it save the artful, not artful dodge, whatever. The uh, Combray one, I guess, out of this. So not too bad. Uh, seems okay. Uh, I like the fact that base level it is conflagrate, but it is two colors and not uber powerful to require two colors just yet. So not really looking at that one. We have Blood of Makar. This is a high pick for me. It is a cursed relic at uncommon for four and a shadow. When one of your units hits the cursed player, it gets plus two attack. So that's pretty strong card. It is a do nothing curse, but a, a relic, but at the end of the day, it can increase the value of all your units, especially if you have evasive units like flyers, which combos really well with our next card, Unkindness. Unkindness is a cursed relic at uncommon as well for two and a shadow. At the end of the cursed player's turn, if they didn't play a unit, sacrifice Unkindness to play three 1-1 one, one Ravens with Flying. So sadly, this is the perfect combo with Blood of Makar because you play this on two, and then hopefully the turn that they break it and you get your three Ravens, you can play Blood of Makar and get them all in there to become 3-1 Flyers. So it stinks having them all in one pack. I think at the moment right now, Unkindness is probably the high runner right here because having essentially getting 3-3 three, three, uh, flying worth of stats for two is a is a trade up the fact that it's across three bodies is sometimes a good thing sometimes a bad thing but typically a good thing so i think unkindness is slightly above blood of makar i'm not excited about picking nivea right now uh, just because baseline a four four for four is is good but not at the requirements of double or four influence requirements thus making it really difficult to come down on turn four at the commons, or commons, we have Ancient Manual, which is the depleted power. Gain an influence in a faction you don't already have, which is the form of fixing for Ancient Manual. And then we have a Sunset Priest, which is the 3-3 three, three Elf Cultist for 3 and a Shadow. Summon, each player discards the top 3 cards of their deck. So uh, it is a symmetrical mill, so you will mill 3 of your cards and 3 of their cards. And it's a 3-3 three, three for 3. There are some scenarios in most cases where this is going to be beneficial to you because you are presumably running things that care about how many units are in your opponent's void as well as yours and you have things like our next card to get stuff back. This is Immortalize. This is draw a unit from your void, decimate, it gets exalted. This is a fast spell for two and a shadow. This card is great. This card is absolutely fantastic it seems to outperform in many cases and on all honesty you're you're almost never unhappy about using this on any unit especially when you're able to decimate it <laughs> next up we have grodov's evangel this is the 2-2 minotaur cleric at common for two time time charge and fate gain a a goal or a time influence so this is the some of the fixing you see in this pack is for ancient manual and evangels are some of the fixing available in this format it's fine they're they're perfectly fine picks i will not fault you for taking it but once again i don't think it's going to beat out immortalize or unkindness or blood of makar next up we have breath of voprex this is the uh, fast spell at common for two and a red 
deal five damage to an enemy unit unless the enemy player chooses to take five damage instead uh, i'm not very happy about this card i think it's underperformed quite a bit it's really only what you want it to be when your opponent is sub 10 health other than that typically cards that your opponent gets to pick the mode means that it's always going to be most beneficial to them and it's probably not going to be the mode that you want it to happen so when you want it to go face they'll probably be okay uh they'll probably be okay yeah they actually reward it so it doesn't go face at all <clears throat> so yes the times you want to kill a unit they're probably just going to take it to the face and then the times that you want to do it to finish them off they'll just send it to a unit so yep breath of oprex not a pick Chance of Grodov is one that I feel like is in high contention right now. It is a slow spot common for two at a time. Each unit in your hand gets a plus one, plus one, and overwhelm. And I've actually been underwhelmed with this card. Um, obviously, best case scenario, you play it on turn two. The fact that it's buffing all your units by giving them overwhelm as well is pretty good. I think I might be happy if this was a plus three, plus three total. So for example, you have you play this and you have three units in, in your hand um, the problem i have with this is if you draw it late you might have only one unit in hand or no units in hand so you know you kind of wasted a card or it was a dead draw so i don't know i've seen i've lost to this kind of where my units didn't quite match up well against theirs because of, they played this on two or three and i've you know seen it where it hasn't done anything so i'm not necessarily wasting a pick on it and definitely not a first pick we have a Rent Seeker, a 3-3 Paladin at common for 4 Justice Justice. Mastery 6, play Curse of Taxation on the enemy player. Curse of Taxation is the one that it takes away one of their maximum powers. Not super excited about this card, we're moving on. Sky Horror Draconis, 4-5 Nightmare Dragon at, un at common. It is 7 and a Primal. Flying. So 4-4 four, four Flyer for 7, alright. Mastery 5, so it has to hit at least 2 times on its own. If you're able to buff it by just 1, which we've seen multiple ways of doing that, the you can play Permafrost on an enemy unit, which is removal, especially in this format. So that seems pretty solid. This card is, is pretty solid of a pick, though I'm not excited about picking a common 7 drop early. So... I will say that I feel like it is between Blood of Makar, Unkindness, and Immortalize. Uh, Blood of Makar will immediately get taken off the list, only the short list, only because of the fact that you require a little bit of setup and it does kind of nothing. And even when you get it going, it may or may not get to the point. It is a very strong card, don't get me wrong. So it's between Immortalize and Unkindness. Uh, I think. I would end up going for Immortalize. Reason being is there's going to be some scenarios where Unkindness is not going to do work for you. Either your opponent is able to continuously play units, especially if you're going up against time where they play that one spell that gives them up to four cultists. Other times, maybe they have like two big flyers or a big flyer in the air so your crows aren't, ravens aren't going to do much. Versus Immortalize, you're pretty much always happy whenever you're able to cast it. So for me, this pack one pick one is Immortalized, but I do encourage you to let me know in the comments below or message me live on twitch what you would have uh taken in this pack but all right guys that is gonna do it for all our preliminary stuff thank goodness which means it is time to dive into our set review dun 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 all right ladies and gentlemen before we jump right into our set review i do want to go over some number crunching or statistics for the set i was hoping to do this in the previous episode considering it was a little bit shorter but sadly we did not have the deck lists for the curated packs but we do now so i'll throw this out for you guys uh, going over the commons and uncommons only rares and legendaries i left out because we're going to see significantly less of them so i will also throw out the disclaimer that the curated packs are absolutely ginormous so some of these numbers may have a little less relevance than usual because of the fact that the pool the card pool for the curated packs is so large so even the commons might have a less than common uh, rate to show up but still it's worth going over for those of you that enjoy the numbers first off at the common and uncommon level the set has 316 total units once again this is combining both the set of flames of zolta as well as what is in the curated draft packs as according to eternal Warcry. 
of those 316, 151 of those are common and 165 of those is uncommon. So interesting enough, we have more uncommon units than we do common units. So once again, that might be an effect of the curated packs kind of modifying, trying to accommodate those synergies and things like that. <laughs> So going over the attacks of these comments and uncommons put together, it's for the number of 2x units that we have in the format. So units that have, doesn't matter what health there is at, but they have 2 attack. We have 98 total for 30.9% of the total amount of units have 1 or 2 attack, correction, regardless of their health. As far as 3x's go, so 3 attack, we have 62 for 19.6%. So about 10% difference between the 2X and the 3X. I granted, notice that does, that does not equal the entire 100% because I am not counting for the 1Xs and then all the way up the rest of the curve as these are probably the numbers that we see most common. So once again, of note, you know, there is a 10% difference between twos and threes, which may play off into the next statistic we're going to go into, which is the health of the units, something that I picked up pretty early on. So we have at X and one, so it doesn't matter what their attack is, but they have a one health only. We have 83 units. That's right. 83 for a whopping 26.2% of the format. So that means at least a quarter of the units where you are going to be seeing at common and uncommon have one health only. That is something to make of note because there are several, you know, things like once again, units that are like, for example, one threes that now all of a sudden have become better in this format where in other formats, they might not be as well. This also means that things that deal that ping effects, like for example, a uh, granite coin or the temper effect that we were gonna talk about later on that deals one damage now has gone significantly better. At X and two, which is pretty much a staple of most formats, we have 80 out of eight, compared to 83. So not much of a drop. And we have 25.3% of the format. So at least half the format sits about the X and one and X and two uh, health range, which is something to consider. That definitely allows us to adjust for damage based removal and things like that because of the fact that half the units you are going to see, chances are, are gonna be two health or less. That's quite important. At the X in three, which is typically the staple with its pivoting point in a format, we have 72 units at three health for 22.8% of the format. So we're, we're seeing a lot at the two, three, and four, or one, two, and three health, okay? Uh, so that is, you know, once again, evaluating things like conflagrate is going to, or some other three damage spells that we have in the format we're gonna talk about that definitely adjusts the tempo right now, as well as for attack. You know, once again, there were 20 units, there's 20% of the units that have at least three attack. So we'll see how often units are trading off and can stabilize. And then of course now at X and four, when we start getting into the bigger units, we have 43 units for 13.6%. So it's looking like I would say four health is really the pivoting point here instead of three, where you start to see the units start to be able to positively block or attack in combat and trade or not trade, but essentially survive without the opponent having some additional ways of doing it or you yourself. So that's something to consider. Our four health is the pivoting point now for this format, at least the stats tell us that. As far as the overall rankings, the highest health in the format is seven, and the lowest health is one, which we've already discussed. The highest attack in the format is seven. So uh, not necessarily meaning there is a seven, seven in the format, but just across the board, all units, the highest attack you're gonna find is, the high, is seven, and the highest health is seven. Now the lowest attack is zero, which in most cases you would think this is not of noteworthy, but I do believe it is a stat to consider because of the fact that there is exalted units running around that we've talked about in the previous set where in most cases you want them to die. So having a zero attack unit that still gives you some bonus, I'm not saying you're, you're slam picking these or windmill slamming these, but the fact that it can continuously block or negate a exalted unit so they're just kind of attacking for nothing is something to note just for future reference. Moving right along to some special keyword abilities. As far as flyers go, this set has 64 flyers total. 
Uh, this is including anything that gives flying, creates a flyer, or is a flyer. I, I went a little wide on the search because I feel like that is relevant. Things like Entomancer that comes into play as only a 3-3 three, three endurance, but if you shift it for 5, it creates a 2-2. Two, two. I think that is of note, so I did include things like that, as well as Changey Stick because of the fact that it makes a flyer. <laughs> so 64 flyers, all right, and that... Uh, a decent amount, I believe. I mean, it's sub 30%, but something to consider. Then the new mechanic, Muster, which I, once again, we talked about in the previous episode. If you play a spell and an attachment in the same turn, you trigger the Muster ability. There are only eight units, and they are co-located in the Legion, so Primal and Time. So that's something to consider. For, for being a new set, pushing a mechanic with only eight units seems really low to me, especially when we look at two of the other numbers, but... It is what it is. Maybe they just kind of wanted to sneak it out there and try it out or it just didn't fit in the design space. Next up, we have Mastery, which once again is a number, uh, a unit's going to have Mastery X or anything is going to have Mastery X. And when it deals X damage, it gets a bonus. So at Mastery, we have 18 units. So that's significantly, it's the highest represented new mechanic in the format. Both Emblems and Bargain are at the rarity. So that I did not include them in this just to go ahead and mention them. So 18 Mastery units. Decimate. Decimate has 13 units or 13 cards that have Decimate on them. And once again, Decimate, you can, when you play the spell, you can just play it as is, or you can Decimate, which is sacrificing one maximum power to get an additional bonus out of the spell or unit or etc. etc. And then finally, Exalted. So units when or anything with Exalted when it dies, yeah, it is units. It's units. When a unit with Exalted dies, its stats and battle skills get transferred to a weapon that you can then freely equip on a or attach to another unit. So there are eight Exalted units in the format. Once again, pretty narrow. Luckily, Exalted doesn't need additional things to survive or work. So I actually think a low number is okay for this because in of itself it works versus Muster requires other cards to make it happen. So very interesting stats here. Going down the line to additional things, just to touch on spellcraft weapons. So these are weapons that you can attach to a unit or yourself, and you're able to play an additional cost to cast a spell that comes attached with it only the turn you play it. Uh, for And this obviously synergizes triggering muster off of one card. This is, there are 15 total spellcraft weapons in the format included in the all four packs. So curated packs as well as Flame Azulta. So 15. Uh, I think considering how large the card pool is, that's not really a lot. We'll see how frequently they do show up once again. Direwolf did state that they adjusted the uh, on a presentation level rarity ratio. I'm not sure what the correct word is for cards that have a little bit higher synergy with the Flames of Zolta cards. With Exalted running around, as well as all these keywords and things like that, I looked at silence effects. There are 13 silence effects in the format, whether it's attached to a unit, attached to a weapon, or attached to, or just a silence spell out of its own. There are 13 total cards in the format that can silence unit, take away flying, take away Exalted, things like that, reset or cancel mastery, all that kinds of good stuff. And finally, the most important stat line of any limited format, the removal. That's right, for removal, we have 42 total cards in the removal package. Once again, remember, there is a huge created pool package. So this is what skewed my numbers a little bit and even surprised me having 42 pieces of removal. That being said, I was a little lax on the initial search and included curses, i.e. stuff like um, torture, the minus four, minus one because it does kill something and effectively negating it whether it takes all the power away or actually straight up effectively kills it also things like fragility i did count um, or uh inflict consciousness so as soon as a unit it's a curse when it sits there as soon as the unit deals damage it just kills it so i included anything that says just kill a unit whether it had some restrictions or conditions to it or not spellcraft spells included as well so for example there is the it escapes me now, but the 7-1 quick draw that you can pay additional one to to cast the quick draw, the five damage spell. And of course, the unstable concoction. Oh, I need to get better with these names. I do apologize, guys. Uh, the 0-0 weapon that you pay, and it does the alchemist blast, the two damage. So things like that, as well as killer effects. But I did not place combat tricks in this category. 
Uh, this was strictly cards that either dealt damage or somehow allowed you to effectively kill a unit without them having to make blocks. <laughs> or attacks, I should say. Uh, out of the 42 total removal spells, 20 of them are damage based, i.e. deal 1 damage, deal 3 damage, deal 10 damage, etc, etc. So that is something to consider as well. And finally, out of the whole 42, only 7 are unconditional. Unconditional means literally that you just point and shoot and the unit dies. Foul Ritual comes to mind, as well as Eviscerate, cards like that that are literally just like, hey, there's a unit, get it off the board. So there are 7 only spells that do that and that's why it's starting to feel like the removal is quite light in this format but that's it guys that is the number crunch for flame of zolta let me know if you like this section i want to do it some more for each pre-release but let me know if you were bored by it or if you liked it and we'll keep it going all right guys let's move on before we get into it, I want to go ahead and mention the grading scale. I'm going to go ahead and move over. I was doing numbers, but uh, apparently it's been universally accepted across the board, the method by limited resources, which is the grading scale. So A through F. And so I will go ahead and use migrate over to that and use as well, since I feel like it might be a little internationally more universal. And as well as the fact that I can just kind of explain it to you. So first off, we have A's. A's are cards that win you the game on the spot. They are absolutely great when you are behind. They help stabilize you. They help bug par parity. They're pretty much good in any phase of the game. A's are things like Minotaur Plate Maker and Rost the Rocking Glacier. They're just fantastic cards that are very difficult to have answered in limited. B's are cards that pull you to a specific color. They are very efficient removal. They are cards that help you win the game in short order. And yeah, they just kind of lean you. They're better than B, they're better than C's. They are not quite straight up bombs like A's are. And this is stuff like Retribution and Heretic's Cannon. They'll push you into a specific color. C's are the pawns of limited, if you will, or the cards that your deck's gonna need them, plain and simple. They aren't flashy, they aren't great, but they make up the majority of the body of your limited deck. Cards like this are Blurry Chaser, Decent 2 Drops and 3s and 4s, etc, etc, and Coastal Recruit. Things like that that just fill up and make up the majority of your deck because this is limited and commons and uncommons. These are cards that you aren't very excited to play, but I guess in a pinch you have to. They're probably the last cards you cut or the last ones that get included in your deck. Cards like Gorgon Cutthroat and Guns Blazing. Finally, we have Fs, which are strictly unplayable cards, typically designed for constructed or just skill test based cards in limited things like Sudden Stampede and Death Pit are amongst these cards in the previous format. And one last optional grade that we have that I will mention from time to time when it comes up are Build Around. These are cards that are on their own pretty horrible and you don't want to play them, but if you're able to take them early and kind of modify your picks or design your deck around them, they can end up being quite powerful and creating a good engine. Cards like Ancient Clock Tower and Svetius Sanctum come to mind when it comes to this card. But all right, guys, that is it for the grading scale. Once again, A, B, C, D, F, and a build around. I hope this helps. And it's just something that I will put, you know, A plus, B minus, things like that to help you have a better understanding of where I'm rating these cards. But that's going to do it. So let's go ahead and start us off with the first one. We're going to go ahead and start with the neutral cards. There are only three, so this is going to be fairly quickly. We have, first off, we have Ancient Manual. We had mentioned that in our pack one pick one. This is the depleted power and gain an influence in a faction you don't already have. So long story short, this is very much for your splash color. You, If you have two sigils in or for it, it's always going to be the one you don't have. So should you already have your splash color, then this will give you a depleted power, but it's gonna be of a fourth color that is not in your deck. It's something to consider if you play it early, obviously selecting that third color, or maybe even the second one if you need it in a pinch is where it would go. Uh, these are fine. I wouldn't take them very highly, but if you don't see anything extremely great, I think this card is just fine. It will definitely allow, facilitate you playing a third color. It is, of course, a depleted power, so that is something sometimes it will take in consideration the uh, tempo cost at it. But overall, yeah, it's there's limited fixing in this format. We're not seeing a lot of things. It is pretty much just Ancient Manual, the Evangels, and um, 
uh the seek powers as far as like generic fixing and then of course we have the insignias to cover up the double uh double influence so yeah guys i would put ancient manual at a c i think it's fine uh i think fixing the fact that it's depleted and it has some limitations to it so obviously it's not going to be fantastic for example it will not get you the second influence of your splash color or your primary color so that is something to consider so i would put it at just a c Next up we have Sacred Seal. This is a power that gains you one health. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll, nothing to say here. I don't see any life gain synergies or life force synergies in this format. So I really don't see the reason to cost yourself an influence to run this. So yeah, Sacred Seal, yeah, D. Like sure, I guess if you want to have it in there just in case you have a better matchup against aggro, I guess, but even then one life is pretty negligible. Might even just put this at an F. So let's go D minus. We'll meet in the middle and go D minus for Sacred Seal. Really don't find a reason for you to be putting this in your deck. Absolutely, you know, unless you really just want the one life, but I don't think it's a thing. And finally, we have this one's a doozy, Sword of Judgment, which is a plus one plus one weapon at uncommon for four. So you're, you got to be saying like what's going on here this doesn't make any kind of sense i don't want to pay four for a plus one plus one but it has mastery five which of course we talked about in the previous episode mastery just means whenever a unit deals x amount of damage whatever the mastery number is it will trigger a mastery ability so for sword of judgment it is a plus four plus four so you play this on a unit and it will also count the damage that the unit does as whole so it won't just count the one one from the sword if you play this for example on a four four you put the sword on it attacks and it survives combat it will trigger the five damage immediately hitting mastery and making it a nine nine the plus one plus one from the four four the plus one plus one from the sword initially and then the plus four plus four from the mastery this card is great it goes in every deck it is absolutely phenomenal if you could put this on a flyer it's even better if you could put it on something that you can pump or initially or activate the mastery on it right away before your opponent has a chance to react to it this card has definitely won some games for me and lost some games on my opponent or and allowed my opponent to win some games against me i think this card is quite good the fact that it goes in every deck i feel like adds an extra level of flexibility to it so for the time being i will actually put this at a b of note you need to have a reasonable unit to put it on but like i said the fact that it is it's just great it's great on any unit with that's evasive and the fact that it's a pretty safe earlier pick because it goes in every deck yeah i like this and there's plenty of good solid targets for it in this format so i like sort of judgment i'll put that at a b and that's it guys that's all the neutral cards we have so let's move on to our multi-faction cards shall we all right ladies and gentlemen and next up we have our multi-faction and we're going to start off with the insignias so the insignias are back we could have picked them up earlier in uh, one of the campaign packs i believe they're the campaign pack that didn't have a campaign anywho they're back they're uncommon and they're in this draft format so once again each uh, the ones that are in there is Rakano, so fire justice sky crag fire primal elysian time primal argent port shadow justice and wait one oh there we go and xenon time shadow so they are all in the set like i said they are uncommon and they read depleted if you have any cards from other factions in your deck so they do accommodate fixing but once again at a price they come depleted so it's perfectly fine taking them for a two color deck just to clean up your influences especially as we saw there are some rares and legendaries that have quite a high influence cost so these are perfectly fine to take for just a two color deck and actually almost preferred since they come in deplete or uh, refreshed i guess or not depleted <clears throat> but they still operate as a depleted uh consider them like a less good or less better uh crest because you don't get the scout but they come in depleted in any three color deck it doesn't matter if uh, oh i guess in your deck so if you have one splash card and you played it already i guess it will come in active but yeah so overall uh, i will put these probably at a c minus d plus uh really they're not a very high pick uh, obviously if they if they work for your fixing they'll be a little bit higher closer to a c 
Uh, the thing is they will always be your fixing. So versus the uh, ancient manual obviously has a chance of not being fixing. So something to take into consideration, but just wanted to cover that cycle real quick. So yeah, nothing much going on there. You could prioritize them a little bit higher if you are going for sure three colors versus two colors and a splash. Moving on to our first real multicolor card. This one is Praxis. So it is Fire and Time, which we covered once again in the pack one pick one. This is Karyo's, Karyo's Choice. It is a fast spot uncommon for two Fire Time. And you can either deal three damage to an enemy unit so it does not go face or put one of your units into your hand so it saves the unit from removal. I think this card is fine. Uh, it's, it's not super efficient removal. It is two for three, which obviously rhyme, lines up with Conflagrate, but Conflagrate was significantly easier to cast as it only required two and had an upside of being able to hit multiple units later in the game. Uh, this card is fine though. Threes, as you'll see later on in our stats, does seem to be fairly reasonable. Decent stat line. Three damage will do some work. And once again, it being fast means it's able to trade with, uh, you know, combat tricks occasionally. The added bonus of being able to save one of your units is nice. It's not a complete like huge thing because obviously there have been other cards that do that. I think this has gone up a little bit because of the fact that it could be removal. And if not, it just happens to save one of your units and stop your opponent's removal and then that is relevant there are some summon effects in the format but overall i think the two color requirement makes it a little bit harder to cast it early which is where you probably would want this to get rid of early aggression so overall i give cario's choice a c next up we have champion grappler this is a five five giant for six fire time this charge has overwhelm and has mastery six so again once it deals six damage total it gets a plus two plus two becoming a seven seven i think this card is pretty good it is six for a five five but you are getting it at charge and overwhelm which means it would be somewhat equivalent to you playing it on turn five somewhat not exactly and it is interesting at the fact that they adjusted it to where the mastery costs only one more than what it can do i master mastery six versus it being a five five so if you're able to pump this any form or fashion the first time then even in your hand obviously there's things in this color there is that we'll talk about later a comp two comments that are able to pump this while it's in your hand so that could be somewhat relevant as well as having some additional pump spells or if you have some justice in there so there is some added bonus of this guy i think he's quite strong actually uh, that being yeah I, I think this card is going to do some work i have not had the chance of playing with it yet i want to put it somewhere along a b minus c plus honestly uh, because i just i feel like the fact that it has charge and overwhelm is so relevant the fact that it has overwhelm means once it gets mastery and it becomes a seven seven beater it's it they can't chump block it and then obviously the charge means that it can come at a surprise even if it is six power that being said it is six power with decimate in the format not sure how often people will be getting the six so yeah, i'll probably put this at a c plus next up we have acclaim artisan this is a two three oni at common for two fire justice and it says your other oni have a plus one attack so once again there's a pump spell obviously the giant did not get the pump from this but there seems to be a heavy oni synergy in this format so this guy is decent of course once again a two three for two is a really good unit stat it blocks a lot it blocks all the evangels blocks a lot of the two ones that we see in the format as well so there is some utility there that being said once again it is dual faction so there's a slightly less chance of you being able to play it in on turn two that being said i do feel like this is a two color format for the most part so there's a really good chance that you could i don't know like i said kind of goes hit or miss on these early dual faction cards you know this is not constructed so you're not gonna have a bunch of banners and crests and stuff to even out your power but there's some more text to it it says mastery four so if this thing blocks or hits the opponent twice it gets exalted so then obviously when it dies it will go to the void but then you will be able to play a weapon on another unit that as of right now if nothing else happens to this guy is simply a plus two plus three which is a pretty decent stat buff to most units as well the fact that it's on both ends plus two and plus three on the health side can make a unit to quite a beater or phenomenal blocker so yeah i like this card i think it's 
fine that being said though it's not absolutely backbreaking and there are chances at times where you play it and you're not going to have any good attacks or any good blocks so i'm going to put uh, claimed artisan at a c i don't think it is completely overwhelming and it's in on its own is not going to be able to close out the game it will change combat math though next up we have a wizened or wizened pretty sure it's wizened wizened and wizened and crone this is oop, let me get it back on the screen a little bit better for my youtubers okay it is a 2-1 yeti at common for two fire primal and it says your spells deal plus one damage so surprisingly though in the format there is quite a bit of spell damage both in primal and in fire so this actually becomes a little bit more relevant uh, once again we are seeing the x1 thing that is going to be quite a staple in this format as you will see but the and then once again we run into that issue two colors chances of playing it on two i do think it's a little higher in this format because more decks are going to be two colors plus we also have the evangels they give you the fate so that's probably gonna be, these are probably going to be a little more common to play at two than you would think but it's something to take into consideration that being said though the plus one spell damage is actually quite relevant like i said earlier for example in primal there is a card that you gain you draw cards equal to the amount of damage that spell did it only does one initially but with this in the board it will do two so that is something to think about i think wizen crone is actually a pretty decent early pick because obviously you can prioritize other cards that being said you have to still be able to draw them and things like that and it is an x1 there are two ones so the body is pretty irrelevant you really are hoping to to capitalize on the the plus one spell damage uh, and there are just so many good two drops in this format so i'm gonna put wizen crone at a c but if you take it early and you kind of start really prioritizing spells like we saw earlier as far as cario's choice and you know uh, some of the other burn spells we'll talk about when we get to fire then it might go up in value next up we have Gemimon, geminons 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 sounds like gemini geminons sounds a little more tribal all right geminons choice this is a slow spell at uncommon for two primal fire it says one transform a unit into a three one frame flame flang flame fang with reckless so three one snake that has to attack or increase the damage of each spell in your hand by one so i actually kind of like this card i would i like it because of the fact that the three you can you're essentially holding it so here's the thing right best case scenario you have like four or three three spells so let's go three you have three damage spells in your hand you play this and then you have effectively added three damage across three spells which is quite good so that's not too bad for two that being said though i also like the fact that it can potentially change uh, your opponent's strongest unit into something that's fairly easy to kill even if you can't even if a 3-1 is an issue which i really don't see that happening in a limited format yeah the worst case scenario you trade a 2-2 for it you or you just take the three you're able to answer your opponent's bomb rares or just a really a unit that's maybe suited up that being said it is t something to take in consideration at the fact that it does only change the unit it doesn't change the weapon on it so if something for example has a exalted weapon on it you will not lose any of the stats on it so something to be said so it pretty much just is changing like their their straight up card downgrading it uh, so i'm going to put gim uh Gimanon's choice at a c i think it's it's decent it's better removal in this format the fact that we're lacking of it but that being said there is going to be some things where this is an exalted format where weapons matter and the fact that that can't control the weapon could be uh, a downside to it moving right along we have one that i've had the experience of playing with and i enjoy quite a bit right now is a rugen's choice this is a fast spell at uncommon to fire justice give one of your units double damage this turn or move a unit of your choice to the top of your deck so let's break this down right first off let me go ahead and move a unit to of your choice to the top of your deck it is the modes on this is actually quite powerful and the reason why i say this is you are you are not gaining a card this is just a card filtering no it's not even card filtering 
card selection. Yeah, let's go with that. This is card selection because later in the game, when you have nothing else to do and this is in your hand, if you look at the board and you feel like you're lacking, you are able to tutor for the unit that will best fit the scenario, whether it's a flyer, whether it's a bomb that you had, whether it's a blocker, something with deadly. So Bruden's Choice offers a little bit of flexibility there, which I think makes it a little bit better when you're behind. Of note, once again, you are spending a card just to make sure you put a card on top of your deck. So it is not card uh, parity. You are losing a card to do that. But I mean, in a pinch, if you're sitting there and flooding and you really need something to do, and you have you know no effective units to play this on, then by all means, why not go look for your bomb rare, right? So I do like that about it, but the first ability, the first mode is actually really powerful in Rakano because of the fact that Rakano has a ton of berserk units and big units and combos with another card we're going to talk about, which is busted, which is draw strength. They give one of your units double damage this turn at fast speed. That's the bonus of this card is absolutely backbreaking. Long story short, guys, there were multiple games where I've won simply by berserking a unit, maybe pumping it with one thing. And then my opponent chose, all right, well, maybe block it, maybe not. And then you do double damage on it all of a sudden. And I won't lie to you guys, I did 32 damage in one turn with this card. So, and a Berserk unit. So, it is the real deal. I like this card quite a bit. Obviously, you have to have, that's why I think the modes work out. Uh, it can, it works really well in parity. It works really well when you're ahead, obviously. And I do think it has some engagement. I even stole a game because of that. My opponent swung for almost lethal. I had to make some bad blocks to make sure I didn't die. And they just thought they were safe at like, I think 14 life. And then did this on one of my berserk units or not even a berserk unit, just a unit that had enough and, and we got there. So I think Rujan's choice is quite strong. I'm gonna put it at a B. I might be regretting it later, but I think Rakano is strong in this format. And Rujan's choice is just one of the cards that sets you over the top. So yeah, I like Rujin's choice quite a bit, and you get a B from the Jedi. Moving right along, we have a Voprex choice. This is a slow spell at Uncommon for two Fire Shadow. The enemy player sacrifices a unit of their choice. So you pretty much want to use this mode when there's only one unit on the board, and that's the one you want to get rid of because obviously, once again, like we talked about a little bit earlier, anytime you give your opponent the choice, it makes it to where they are always going to pick the thing that you don't want them to, to pick. And so this is kind of weak in a sacrifice removal type of way because it's only at its best when there's only one you on the board. Now granted, that will work sometimes, especially later in the game. Maybe you've attritioned each other out and they finally are like, okay, cool, everything's spent. I'm going to play the bomb. Or obviously on turn two or three, when they play the one unit, they're like, yeah, that's pretty scary. I want to get that off the board. Then you could do it that way. It does also get around Aegis because it forces the enemy player to sacrifice a unit. It does not target the unit themselves. That's a good plus to it. The other one is draw a dragon or weapon from your void. So immortalize, right? So there's a little bit of diversity there. There, There is a bonus to that. So I think it's okay. Uh, so with that, yeah, I'm just going to put it in medium. It's going to be a C for me. It, it just There's immortalize in the format. And I think that sacrificing unit thing is going to be so um incidental not incidental what's uh situational that you're just not gonna get your real value out of that mode next up we have cinder dragon this is a 4-4 nightmare dragon at common for six fire shadow and it has flying it's pretty simple just a beater 4-4 flying at six is is reasonable that's par for course you know you if you start to go down to five and and six or five and four for flyer you're really looking at rare territory or just want some kind of downside or something so this thing just being a four four for five or four four for six and flying is perfectly fine you'll add it to your deck should you need some finishers but cinder dragon you are a c next up we have amari or uh, amri's i think it's amri's 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 choice is a fast spell at uncommon for two time shadow or correction two time and justice mode one give one of your units plus three plus three and overwhelm this turn sweet okay that's fine that's a great combat trick uh, it is two we've, we've kind of seen it for one with finest hour and barrel through being two for some fixing but so instead of fixing you get overwhelmed and once again barrel through was 100 serviceable so this card is solid and then second one second mode is 
Or mode 2 is silence an attacking enemy unit and put it into the enemy hand. Uh, that seems pretty good to me too. Uh, you know, like both sides are a form of removal. In some cases, silencing a unit will do a lot. The fact that it bounces it will also get rid of weapons that are on it and things like that. It cancels out Exalted. It, uh, yeah, I, I think this card is actually quite strong and both modes are gonna have a bit of use and versatility. It stops dragons, stops them from flying and stuff like that. And they have to replay their, you know, for two, you're essentially trading up on tempo because you're making them reset your turn. So yeah, I like this card quite a bit. It also helps against the previous mentioned Rujin's Choice. If someone decides to Rujin's Choice you, and you're like, oh no, that's lethal all of a sudden. You can silence the unit and bounce it back into their hand. So yeah, I like Amari's Choice quite a bit. I actually am going to put this at a B-. minus. I think this card is good. Next up, we have Intrepid Longhorn. This is a 3-3 Minotaur Mage at common for 2 time justice. So 3-3 three, three for 2. Solid. I like it. I think that's pretty strong if anyone remembers the um oh gosh darn i'm forgetting it now instigator there we go I, I forgot the other word instigator and teacher of humility teacher and instigator both three threes for two that are quite powerful this thing is probably even just as strong and limited uh, that being said we also once again double faction but with uh the evangels i think it might balance out and then it has a mastery six so when this thing blocks or attacks twice obviously escaping a pump spell like the one we just talked about play a random sigil from your deck so a little bit of ramp so that's not too bad there's a good chance this might ramp you especially in limited if you are on the play play this they play their two drop it's probably a two two you swing in you get in for three then if they play a three three then you just wait to block or you swing in anyways and ramp and you get a card out of them so yeah i like this card i think it's pretty good uh, that being said once again drawing it late doesn't do much and you know it has a little slight variation to it so i'd probably give it a i think it's still c honestly i think this card is strong but once again there's a lot of three threes for three in this format both at three and four so and there's a chance you might not play it on two so yeah i think i'm gonna give intrepid longhorn to see at the end of the day it's still a three three even if you could rush it out a turn sooner Sometimes the boards get gummed up to where you're not being able to trigger that mastery. Plus, the mastery is not a set bonus, so you're simply ramping. So, I think it's medium. So, yeah, Intrepid Longhorn, you get a C. Next up, we have Sodi's Choice, which is a fast spell at Uncommon for two time primal. Play Sandbind on an enemy unit, which is a curse that prevents it from flying let me just double check that yep cursed unit can't fly <clears throat> i like to be a little bit careful and and or or sorry or negate an enemy fast spell so this card seems okay to me the reason why i say that is as we learned earlier in the stats there are quite a bit of flyers in here even though it's not crazy insane the so being able to kind of prevent a fire especially when we see so many dragons running around and exalted slapping weapons on top of things i think there there is some value to that uh, that being said just a spell that does that is a little underwhelming the the fact that it can negate an enemy fastball does make combat a little bit easier because of the fact that you are able to kind of swing with impunity not worried about a combat trick blowing you out that being said though i think both of these abilities or modes are a little narrow that sometimes may or may not come up in limited so i'm gonna give sodi's choice a d i think it is playable i just don't think you're super excited about playing it and there are gonna be times where it's gonna do some work but i think it's gonna be one of the last inclusions in your deck next up we have a wanderlust kieran this is a one two kieran at common for two time primal it has flying so one two flyer for two seems fine we've seen that plenty of times but as muster plus one plus one of note this is permanently and remember guys you can only muster once per turn but you can muster every turn if you so like in the pre-release event i did play uh the elysian muster deck and these guys did some work for me especially when you have pairs of them because then you're essentially every time you muster adding two uh plus two plus two to the stats of the board of course that may or may not happen at limited and it synergizes a little bit with the spellcraft weapons because obviously it has evasion so you play the 
spellcraft weapon on it making the stats bigger gets an additional bonus on top of that so there is some value to be had there once again the biggest part is that it has the evasion so chances are making it bigger is a good thing that being said hey coming down turn two is a little bit harder than usual because it is two factions it does have evasion but on its own one damage a turn is not a big deal we've talked about that multiple times on the show where if you attack just with this it will take 25 turns to kill your opponent versus if you have a 2x it will now take you somewhere around the roughly about 13 turns so that is a huge you know cut in uh damage or in in, t in time so i think it's fine but i also don't think very highly of it so i'm just gonna give wanderlust here an ac next up we have nahid's Right, yeah, Nahid's Faithful. This is a 2-1 cultist, which is important, at common for one time shadow. So you can essentially play this on one if you have a you know, dual influence uh, power to come into play. But because of its summon ability, you really don't want it to. Nahid's Faithful has lifesteal and summon you may sacrifice another unit to give nahid's faithful a plus two plus two so if you choose to sacrifice another unit you can make this a four three lifesteal which any of you that have seen hojin in constructed that is quite powerful stat line this card has done some work i do like it it is in Zenin, which typically has cards to sacrifice like wisps or other one one cultists and things like that so it does have some dragon fodder this does make it a perfectly fine one or, or two or three drop as a two one lifesteal and the fact that you can cash in one of your other units essentially trading up in stats if you can sack for example a one one to give this a plus two plus two then you're trading up in stats of note it can also be repeated if you are able to reoccur nahid's faithful so should it die as a 4-3 and then you immortalize it back then it will have the ability to sack another unit and then bump up to a 6-5 so yeah i think it's fine um, once again not super thrilled nahid's faithful you are a c next up we have nahid's choice this is a slow spell at common or uncommon correction so uncommon slow spell for two time shadow pretty Pretty insane artwork actually i kind of like the fact they're just dragging this ninja away or i should say cultist but you can choose one of these two modes one play two one one cultist which obviously we just talked about synergizes well with dragons and sac effects and the heeds faithful like we just talked about and then the other one is enemy player discards a spell or sight of your choice from their hand this one's a little tougher uh this one you kind of have to inkling okay they spend a couple of turns where they haven't played a unit they have three cards two cards in hand it's harder to probably pick a site out of their hand in limited this way but it, you know they're like hey i want to attack with my bomb i want to make sure it's safe to survive combat you can do this to make sure the coast is clear take out whatever combat trick or removal so they've been holding on to before you even play your bomb so there is some value I, I actually like this card i think the flexibility of it being two two for two or and or later in the game getting a key spell out of your opponent's hand obviously you're taking a risk doing that i think this card is plenty serviceable so i like nahid's choice probably at a c plus maybe c plus because like i said the the two two for two is fine when you need a pinch then the fact that it also synergizes with sack outlets because you're getting two units on one card and the fact that it can clear the way for a really good card later yeah sure i'll give nahid's choice a c plus now we are at Perul's choice Parole's Perul Perul's choice i don't know these names Blue, direwolf definitely needs to come out with like a pronunciation guide or something this is a fast spell at uncommon for two justice primal and the modes are draw a curse of your choice from your deck that you haven't played this game that's very narrow and specific or give one of your units plus one plus one and aegis uh man i i it's kind of narrow like it helps you get a really good curse if you have like a bomb curse or something it's an essentially another version of it once again uh, oh wait you says you haven't played this game so i guess if you have it in your hand yeah but what are you gonna do just sandbag one of your curses till you draw the choice or the other curse yeah that seems a little narrow i, I that being said 
uh, it does draw the curse it doesn't put it on the top of your deck so it is a tutor effect i don't know i guess it depends it goes up on value that if you have like the better stronger curse or something like that i'm not super high on that and then they give your unit plus one plus one and ages it'll help it win combat it negates a combat trick it negates a removal spell sure i mean uh what was it rapid reflexes or sharp reflexes saw play and it was a plus one plus one in scout this is a permanent plus one plus one so it's kind of on the board there with a little tutor flexibility and a color and two colors that do care about curses uh, i'm kind of yeah i think it's a c minus i'm gonna put Peril's choice at a c minus next up we have a misery walker misery walker is a two three unseen at common for three justice primal it has flying and life steal while an enemy is cursed so of course this is an enemy so it could be a unit or a player and a two three for three that has flying and life steal is seems pretty solid and once again it is in Haru, which seems to be a cursed focused uh faction and there's some pretty le legit curses most of the time i feel like curses aren't gonna last very long if we're talking about things like unkindness and and uh what's the other one untrust or distrust mistrust mistrust those don't stick around very long but hey if you get two or three hits with this thing i mean it's evasion and lifesteal which are both great stats to have because it helps you win races and equips well obviously if you can give this guy exalted that's busted it is situational though but i think the benefit of the fact that you are just gonna have incidental curses out i mean geez if you combo this thing with blood of my car like it's game on worst scenario obviously is you put it on like an afflict consciousness or something like that but then again your opponent has to decide now are they gonna try to cash in their guy early to get the curse off the board or are they going to wait till they get a good block so yeah i like misery walker i like it quite a bit ah man it's just a, a situational thing to see how often curses are going to come down it's kind of premature so i think i'm still going to put it at a b plus or c c plus it's if there's a lot of curses and they're super easy and they stick around a lot things like torture then misery walker will be like a b b minus but if curses aren't as they don't stick around as long as we think they will then i'll put it closer to a c it's hard to know and uh, you know in a format that we don't know how it plays out yet with all these specific synergies and stuff like that i guess i should have checked for curses in the uh the earlier stats so that was my fault i should have done that next up we have farouk's fell rocks fell rock i'm gonna go with fell rock that sounds the best actually i just came up with that i've said it every other which way and fell rock sounds kind of cool so fell rock's choice kill a oh i'm sorry it is an uncommon fast spell for two primal shadow so film kill a cursed unit and draw its curses from the void that's awesome i've seen this play out and is really good especially if you combo it with stuff like for example wanted poster so then you play the wanted poster in the unit you kill it with Farouk's choice you draw two cards and you get the wanted poster back in your hand this card is quite good it combos well with torture combos well with uh what's another good curse i guess fragility uh, pretty much any curse you can put on a unit obviously i think wanted poster is probably the best thing for it but the fact that you for example let's say you, you you're you can play a torture on a unit to slow it down maybe it's their bomb right so now instead of being like a seven seven it's a three six but it's still beating then it slows it down and you can draw the fruit's choice kill it and get your torture back so i do kind of like that i think yeah i, I kind of like it i think that aspect of it is pretty good in this format next up negate an enemy spell played on you or one of your units then steal it and play it from the void that's also pretty good honestly because of the fact that it's not only negating the spell but it's allowing you to play it which in most cases if it was beneficial for your opponent it would be beneficial for you so i actually like Farouk's choice quite a bit i think there's some um I, I you know the removal essentially sounds like a two for one but it's really not since you get the card back and once again i do think negating a spell in combat and then obviously being able to immediately play it is really good and it, it comes well with like huge blowout spells like if someone tries to flame blast you you know what i mean so they try to flame blast you for like eight you can literally use this to cancel that out and then shoot them back for for well i guess flame blast won't work because you want to have fire influence but yeah all right all right all right so Farouk's choice you get a c you get a c for me 
you know obviously perfect you're looking at like taking a cut ties or a pump spell or something like that but yeah for Oak's choice or actually a pump spell won't work played on you or one of your units so yeah actually it has to be like a kill spell still pretty good but fair so actually yeah i'll put for Oak's choice of the c i'm glad i reread that so see guys you are learning with me next up we have elos elos elos's elite this is a paladin a 1-4 paladin at common for two justice shadow so argent port decimate abilities don't cost you maximum power yeah this is good i like this card uh, i'm gonna put it as c plus reason being is like we stated earlier in the stats uh three two and three damage and are pretty common the most common in this format so a four toughness unit is going to stand to be able to block quite a few things force them to use a trick it comes out on turn two which we saw from scaly gruon is a great time to gum up the board and now with your demo decimate cards being free so to speak you are able to not really have to make that decision earlier in the game do i decimate my draw strength on turn four or do i just play it now you can just decimate it get the bonus and like sweet move on with your day so i actually do like Elaz is elite that being said it is still just a one four and obviously how much decimate you have in your deck is going to depend on how good or bad this card is so Elaz is elite you are a c now the final choice for the cycle is Elaz's choice and this one is a slow spell at uncommon for two argent port again so one justice one primal or i'm just correction one shadow one justice one shadow you gain a three armor meh pretty medium pretty actually underwhelming to be honest with you since we saw grit and it didn't do it or each unit gets a minus one minus one so we did see this in the last format in the form of winnow winnow was six but also only hits your opponent's units so this is a tough one to say to evaluate uh once again we did find out that there was a ton of x ones in the format like a ton so this could easily be a one-sided board wipe or a three for one or two for one and not really cost you much granted it is minusing all units so your units are gonna get smaller too but theirs are all getting smaller that being said anything that plays afterwards might be too big so there's a cost i'm not super excited about eagle choice it just both modes seem kind of underwhelming to me best case scenario out of this card i would think is that you get like a two for one minusing the whole board and then killing two of their x ones uh it being two means you could sneak it in everywhere that it being a slow spell means you have to do it after combat so that could be a thing as well you get in with a couple of units maybe they make some easy blocks thinking things will survive and then you minus it but of course once again you could lose some of your units as well yeah elos choice you get a d for me i almost want to say it's an f but like i said because of the fact that there's so many x1s in the format i feel like maybe the second mode is gonna be a little bit more useful so elos choice you get a d <laughs> And finally, our last multi-faction card we have is Wretched Raven. This is a 1-4 bird at common for 3 shadow primal. So, film colors. It has flying. And when Wretched Raven attacks, the enemy player discards the top 2 cards of their deck. So, pretty medium card overall. We did talk about earlier how 1-4 is a decent amount of stats. And the fact that it's a flyer means that it can pretty much... I feel like it could block most things in the air and tussle quite well. If your opponent isn't doing anything, you can attack with it to start milling them. There is a mill deck in the format. I will not deny that. That being said, though, I am not you. Granted, it's only the enemy player. You can't mill yourself. Two cards is something. Oh, if we saw that from Umbran, it's free just because you have to attack somewhat. So you're losing a blocker to mill two cards again for one. It's not too bad. It comes out on turn three. Uh, there are some flyer synergies as well in the format, but we'll have to once again see how that plays out i'm trying my best to kind of give it like a medium grade like a grade in the middle based on what synergies i think are out there because obviously the build arounds and stuff like that will happen but that's also what the first impressions or hot take show will be about like cards that <coughs> might over or underperform based on how the format actually plays out so i'm gonna give wretched raven a c i think it's a good card but maybe a c plus if the mill deck is a lot more viable and i mean there is some merit to it there are cards that care about how many cards are in your opponent's void so this obviously fuels that so this might actually be closer to a c plus and it carries weapons well really well because once again that four toughness yeah all right fine wretched raven you get a c from me
or C plus, I'm sorry. But all right, guys, that is gonna do it for the multi-faction section. So definitely take a break if you need to, hit pause, go grab some water, some coffee, hit the bio, and we'll move on to the next section because we are in still the forefront of this long episode. Hope you're enjoying it. So the first primary faction we're gonna be talking about is time. I'm gonna start rotating them, so I don't wanna start uh, at fire every time. So we're gonna be shifting down the line every set. That way I make sure I give every faction a little bit of equal love, if you will. So first up, we have Ardent Convert. This is a 1-1 cultist at common for one at a time, and it just says exalted. So nothing much to say here. You're pretty much just uh, giving a plus one plus one to another unit Obviously the exalted is adjusted based off of what the stats are when it dies So combat tricks and weapons and stuff do get added on as well as a as well as Battle skills so <clears throat> that is something to consider it does facilitate bumping up another unit like your example Let's say we use um, dramatic exit so it gives a plus four for the turn so it's a five one going in your opponent has to decide on whether taking five damage or taking or blocking and potentially losing a unit and then when it dies the exalted obviously will pass it along to the next thing so then it gets a plus five plus one to something else so that is something to consider and then it is like i said earlier xenon being the sacrifice stuff for greater value faction so it is a little bit better than it seems as far as the just being a one one for one but it still is a one one for one so ardent convert you get a c moving along we have aspirants robes or aspirants i have no idea i really gotta get better about pronunciation considering i do a podcast but anywho aspirants robes is a plus one plus one weapon at uncommon for one at a time so once again one one for one but it has a summon ability create and draw a 1-1 cultist so you're kind of getting a 2-2 for one to spread across two things and then of course it has spellcraft for play patience so patience you target it on your opponent and it create causes every card in their hand each card both unit and spell to be increased by one so that is quite a tempo play it's not great um, this, I'm pretty medium on this card. Uh, that being said, it does trigger muster, so it goes up a little bit. That being said, I don't think it's very exciting. So I think because of the two, it gives you a body to sacrifice, upgrades another one, and it gives you a muster. And I still think this card's closer to a D. <sighs> yeah, I mean, I really want to give it a D, but maybe because of the muster, it's a C. So... Yeah, I'm gonna give it a C for it. No, no, I don't. I just don't think you want to be playing this. That's yeah. Even with the the blocker and stuff, so I'm just gonna give it a D. I think it's a D card. It'll make your deck, but you're not excited about playing it. Moving right along, we have Borderlands Lookout. This is a zero one at uncommon. What Elf Explorer for one at a time? Okay, okay, that doesn't seem very exciting, but plus one plus one for each type of influence the enemy player has so baseline this is going to be a two two for three all right that's that's or, or, i'm sorry two three sorry correction a two three for one uh, that's not bad that's not bad it's not super exciting you don't think you broke the bank with it and there are chances that when people will get greedy with their decks and they have a splash which i assume a lot of the majority of people will do especially coming off of a five color format you will see this be a three four for one which is quite good and we established earlier that four health and three attack is a really good sweet spot and as far as the limited format goes and in tussling with other units so i like this card that being said it's not going to be i mean I, I i highly highly doubt this card is going to be a four or five in this format but you know you never know but i i think once again that's gonna be very narrow send me a screenshot on twitter if you do end up seeing this or you play yours as a four or five but so yeah borderland scout you get a c for me i think it's a good card but once again top end it being a three four it will gum up the board some but not immensely next up we have chant to grodov this is a highly contested card as of right now at least from what i've gathered some people are super high on it some people are super low this is a slow spell at common for two and a time 
each unit in your hand gets plus one plus one and overwhelm so best case scenario you play this on turn two with four units in hand and you give plus four plus four and overwhelm across the you know to to your hand which is pretty good for a permanent plus four plus four and overwhelm for two power is awesome right that is best case scenario worst case scenario is you draw this thing in the late game with nothing but two combat tricks in your hand and then it just sits there and does nothing and maybe is a mustard trigger so yeah see i just i'm not high on this card i i, if, I don't get me wrong i have lost to it already twice i think where my opponent has done it on two or three and it's just done some immense work or like things that it, especially in the mirror it's kind of like a mirror breaker but yeah no i i just can't i personally can't go high on chant to grow it off so i'm gonna give it a d i think you really don't want to be playing this once again there are gonna be some times where it's gonna be broken you're gonna be like oh my god this card's a b but i think it's a d maybe a d plus maybe because it does have some chances on turn two and then of course once again there's a chance that you can play it on turn two but you have one or maybe two units in your hand and that's it so yep i'm low on chant to grow it off Moving right along, we have Zoltan Brushfang. This is a 1-2 Kirin at Uncommon for one at a time. Mastery 2, so it deals 2 damage total, whether it blocks, gets in there, uh, hits another unit, etc. It gets deadly, gains deadly, so that's great. Right, now it's it's upgrading. That being said though, unless you're able to pump it, it is 2 attacks. So somehow a 2-1 has to survive 2 attacks, which could prove to be a little difficult, maybe not. And then mastery four so if it manages to get in there somehow dealing four damage of course one single pump cell like a plus three plus three will trigger both masteries it gets a plus three plus three becoming a four five deadly which is extremely powerful right because then they're gonna have to double block it or trade up either way it's gonna trade up and it's gonna for sure kill the unit unless they have our next card we'll just we'll talk about in a moment so i think this card is okay you still have to be able to deal the two damage and sometimes you're just not going to want to spend a pump spell on your one play or your one drop to kill their two drop uh, that being said there might be a thing there because of the fact that then it gets deadly so i think zoltan brush fang it's good and can be good but it's kind of situational so i'm putting it at and then you know what happens when you draw it late in the game right so brush fang zoltan brush fang you are a c to me next up we have metal metal is a common fast spell for one at a time so easily to leave up give one of your units invulnerable to damage this turn so this card is actually outperformed on i would have actually probably given this card somewhere about a d minus uh, or a d plus a c minus but because of the fact that it cancels mastery right if a unit swings it's about to get mastery you can metal your unit and either kill their unit or just stop your unit from dying as well as preventing it from getting a mastery trigger it prevents deadly it is actually quite good in that respect the fact that it's able to stay up fairly open means you can stop killer effects so this card is actually it stops units from you know uh well it won't stop an exalted trigger obviously but uh yeah and then that's another thing too uh no no that won't work i don't think invulnerability actually that's a good question i don't think it does i don't think there's anything that says invulnerable to damage permanently so i'm pretty sure that won't transfer over i'm just gonna go ahead and say no if i'm wrong let me know but i don't want to take the time to go digging to try to find that answer because i'm pretty sure it's just a no but it was something fun to think about they haven't added that indestructible to the game yet but i digress anywho yeah so it actually has some additional play to it than you would think uh, that being said though obviously uh, as far as being more aggressive you for it to be like a straight up removal spell you need your unit to be bigger than theirs you want to catch them in like a double block type scenario or something like that when it comes to that regards so this card is still somewhat situational as far as offensive goes or offense or being a removal spell so it's just gonna be a flat c for me like i said i think the fact that it tussles well with like mastery and additional little things like that makes it a little bit better for me it's higher than it would seem so yeah it's gonna be a c metal you are a c all right we have our first of the cycle the evangels the evangels are another form of fixing they are all i'll cover it real quick but we still will cover each individual one just not spend as much time so i'll actually go a little more in depth on these now but the evangels there is a cycle so every faction gets one they are all two twos for two at common 
Okay, and they both have required double influence of their respective factions. So for example, Grodov's Evangel is a 2-2 two -two for two at common Minotaur Cleric and requires double time. They all have a keyword or, or battle skill. So this one has charge and then they all have fate gain an influence of their respective factions. So this one will give you, well, as soon as you draw it or if it's in your opening hand, it gives you a time influence. So it kind of, that's where the fixing comes in, where it gives you an influence of that faction. Obviously you prefer for these to be your splash color because when they come in, they give you your splash color, but it's okay playing them as your main faction as well. They also require double influence to play them on too. So they can sometimes be a little wonky to play, but but the fact that they give you fixing is pretty huge. So I like these cards. And then of course, having a two, two for two is always great. That's gonna make up the, the majority of your early game plays. So I like the Evangels. I will put them at a C plus. Uh, yeah, I don't think they're insanely powerful. The biggest one we'll get to later for me is probably either the Justice or the uh, Fire one, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. So yeah, Grodov is Evangel you get a B or C plus. Next, we have High Prophet of Soul. This is a 0-3 cultist at uncommon for two and a time. And it when you comes into play, it gives you one plus one maximum power. So on curve, it bumps you from two to four power should you play a power on your third turn. When another cultist goes to the your void, plus one maximum power. So this card is deceptively good. It's done from work for me. I actually kind of like it. It's weird because it typically would try to do the set really or this before. But now that I've had some chance to play with some of these cards, I will go ahead and talk about them a little bit. And uh, I like this card. I really do. I think ramping in time is quite valuable. There are some heavy top end things like Rodos Favor and the Mandrake that you really like getting out. And so being able to ramp this and then obviously with other colors, if you go Elysian, you can get dragons out and if you go justice you can get some big units out early so i actually like this once again xenon or is a sacrifice and it just says cultist so remember we've been pointing out there's already a couple of cultists in play so as you play those cultists and you sack them you are gaining additional value off of this guy by gaining you maximum power ramping you like obviously later in the game it's not as good so that is something to consider but i do think this kind of runaway can run away with the game if they're not careful so uh probably gonna be no it's definitely not a b minus that's too much because the day it's still a zero three and of course once again it could block exalted units so they do not get the exalted trigger and the three health isn't great but it's not bad it does a pretty good job blocking yeah i think it's still a c plus i think i might be pushing it a little bit uh, i think it's a c plus because the ramp is relevant but i guess in later in the game it does very little hmm yeah, I think it's fine. I think C plus is fine for uh, high profit. All right, Spike Tail Kieran. Spike Tail Kieran is a two two at common, and it's Kieran for two and a time and mastery six. So your units get plus one plus one. Of note, <coughs> excuse me. This is a static or flat rate. I'm sorry. It happens immediately. So all the units that are in play, including itself, will get a plus one plus one, and that is it. It is not a static ability like. Um, uh, obelisk or anything like that or harvest or horn of harvest where as long as it's in play all your units get it it will only give the plus one plus one to all the units that are in play any units that happen that follow after that will not get that bonus and should spike tail kieran die the other units will still keep their plus one plus one it has some additional text that says pay six to give your spike tail Karen a plus four plus four this turn so it can effectively it's a two two for two which is once again just fine if it gets in there it works up towards its mastery if it does not you can simply wait till later in the game where you have a power sink and you can make this a six six and attack now granted one thing i will say is that it does not say up to once per turn or only once per turn so should you find yourself in a situation where you have 12 power somehow maybe with the high profits of soul that we just talked about you can activate this twice giving it a plus eight plus eight making it a 10 10 but yeah this card is actually outperformed i like it quite a bit i think it's a pretty easy c plus i don't quite think it's a b mainly because of the fact that uh 
I mean, it can win you the game, but and I like the fact that it's good early and it's good late because it's a power sink as well as the plus one plus one. But I still don't think it's game winning. You know what I mean? It's not completely game changing. So I do think it's a higher pick, but it's still very much in the C category. So Spike Tail Karen gets a C plus. I think it's one of the premier two drops. To be completely honest with you. All right, unmake. This is kill an enemy attach. Oh, I'm sorry. It is a fastball at uncommon for two in a time. And kill an enemy attachment. Decimate. Kill an additional enemy attachment. So this one is probably still a D because it only focuses on attachment. Though it does have more targets in this format. Uh, as of right now, I still put it as a D. I don't think it's overwhelming. I have lost this card one time because they decimated and killed. Like they took their big guy off of like... I forgot what like maybe i had a permafrost on it and then took out one of my exalted weapons on a unit so that was a bit of a blowout and once again that's pretty much what makes this card playable i think it still think it's a d because there are going to be decks that don't give you the option of using this effectively but once again the attachments do include curses both curses on yourself like blood of makar and you know permafrost and inflict consciousness those kinds of things as well as weapons relic weapons i don't think are really all that predominant in this format but weapons for example exalted weapons and additional uh, spellcraft weapons that go on units this can kill and the fact that it could be a two for one costing one of your powers leader in the game it is a fast spell so it does operate much like a combat trick sometimes for example if they're swinging in with some kind of let's say seven seven unit because it's a three three with a a, a weapon on it you could use it use the unmake to take the weapon off and then block and kill it so there's some value there but that being said i still think this is kind of like in the d category i'll have to explore it some more to figure out if it is bumped up to a c if you're comfortable main decking this and it's not one of your last playables next up we have eager offering eager offering is a zero four cultist at uncommon for three and a time and so pretty unimpressive so far but at the end or at the start of your turn sacrifice eager offering to draw two cards i'll tell you right now i like this card a lot i think every time deck wants to play them one way or another so first off it is the a delayed time wisdom of elders if you will right because you're spending three to draw two cards so that puts you up a card the zero four body means that it could potentially block for a turn if you're up against the more aggressive deck if you will you do want to be careful with that because it does have to survive till the start of your turn it's not, it's not just whenever it dies so that is something there may be chances where you actually don't block but you'll see you never know and of course it is a cultist and it's sacrificing itself which we saw earlier has multiple synergies across this board so i actually do like eager offering quite a lot i think the fact that it draws you cards it blocks well it has synergies it's in a relevant unit type so i'm gonna put your offering at a b I, or b minus i do think i think it's a good card i like it a lot i think the synergize effect is going to play off quite well so that might be a bit of a high one but i like it I, I i take these whenever i can to be completely honest with you i think the only thing i take over these are either bombs or removal spells all right moving right along we have edict of grodoff so there's a cycle of edicts in this format which are color hosers if you will so of one color and they essentially are extra or hyper efficient or effective super effective hyper effective i don't know what's the pokemon term against the their enemy colors which is typically two okay so edict of grodoff is a fast spell at uncommon for three and a time and they're all different they're not the exact same as the evangels these actually vary in speed and uh cost and all that stuff put an enemy unit or spell into its owner's hand so it can act as a temporary counter or negate to a spell by balancing it back in their hand and then it does buy you some time to play around it but if it's if or as well as unit you can bounce so it also gets rid of weapons and equipment stuff like that it is a fast spell so you can use that in the middle of combat that goes up in value so view it kind of like a blink there just a little bit better of a blink but if it's a primal or shadow unit or spell put it on the bottom of its owner's deck instead yeah this seems extremely powerful to me i think both sides of these or both the okay side and the hyper effective side are good 
on Edict of Grodoff. So I actually like this card and the fact that it can essentially become a removal spell against two factions. I, I like this card a lot. I'm actually going to put it at a B. And I think it's because of the fact that on the base level of it, Blink is fine. Blink has seen plenty of work in multiple formats. Once again, this is a format and curse, like a weapon and curse synergizing format. So bouncing is relevant. The fact that it can cancel a spell for a turn or essentially be straight up removal makes it quite good. So yeah, Edict of Grodoff, you get a B from me. I like it. Moving right along, guys, we have Wilderness Refuge. This is a plus one, or I'm sorry, a relic at common for three and a time. It says plus one maximum power, period. So it just kind of does a really bad impression of a power stone. But Spellcraft 3, play Lost in the Mist. So you can play this for six. What Lost in the Mist does is put an enemy unit into the enemy player's hand and it will cost or it with cost increase by two so if you bounce for example a five cost unit it will now be a seven cost unit for your opponent so not bad not bad i think it's okay um once again i am ramp does play a role ramp on its own isn't that exciting and ramping on three is a little rough it does take you from three to five so we have to see how effective the five drops are for at least in this faction and then later on in the game, you're able to kind of give a big tempo play to your opponent. Yeah, that being said, I'm, I, I still don't feel like it's it just kind of doing nothing on turn three. It doesn't seem all that exciting. At least when you ramp with a unit, you have a unit. So I'm kind of low on Wilderness Refuge. I think you'll want a little bit higher should you have more muster in your deck. But yeah, I think Wilderness Refuge is a D. I just don't think the ramp is all that important. And then what, you know, late game, you get to the tempo play. So it has a little bit of early play, a little bit of late play, but neither of them are super exciting. So Wilderness Refuge, you get a D. Swing C Kieran is our next one. This is a 2-4 Kieran at common. I have no idea what Kieran's are. I've seen everything on them, so I have no idea what a Kieran is. It is a three and a time for it, and it has muster, create, and draw a 1-1 humbug with flying. So this card's good. I like it. I think it's I think it's a solid C. Reason being is 2-4 is good stats, as we saw from Watchful Amanara. And the fact that this ability will kind of trigger on its own means you won't miss the scout ability like most people do on Watchful Aminar. So I, you know, two four for three is great, really serviceable and limited. And the fact that it gives you a one one flyer, granted one one isn't great, but you're getting a free flyer is quite relevant. Obviously, this this body carries weapons well, also because of the high toughness. So I like Swing C, Karen. I think it's a C. Nothing much to go there. Moving right along. Uh, so. Proselytize? Proselytize? Proselytize. I think so. I think that proselytize. I'm good. I'm pretty sure that what it is. If I'm wrong, by all means, please correct me and let me know. But proselytize right now is what I'm going to go for. And this is a common spell for three and a time. It says play two one one cultist. So once again, getting three or two units off of one card is solid. I like this. I think it's fine. Once again sacrifice units cultist matter etc etc decimate create and draw two additional units oh so this actually puts this card over the top for me to be honest with you i think it's a very very solid c plus reason being is baseline you play it on three you get two cultists that's already fine right it's a little underwhelming getting two two worth of stats for three but they are across two bodies but when you decimate i.e later in the game you get four total units to go into play and then you're able to play two more later or right now this card has really overperformed it buys you a ton of time in the form of chump blockers gives you plenty of fodder for sacrificing and that they're cultist like so i like this card i think it's going to go in any i think you don't mind having a one of in any cultist deck or time deck and then you're definitely going to want a few more if you're the sacrifice synergy cultist dragon thing going on so i like proselytize quite a bit i think it's a c plus I've seen this card, like I said, I saw that card buy you a ton of time. Moving right along, we have Cult Recruiter. This card is a 3-3 cultist at common for 4 time time. It has Ambush and Mastery 4. This card's medium. Uh, you would think that the Mastery, I think we're, I think my opinion might have just been slightly skewed because of the Sabertooth, the 3-5 
that four that has ambush but this card highly underperforms for me and for what i've seen the fact that the three like we talked about earlier three is not really the pivoting point in this format a lot of things can kill three health units means that there's very few times this thing can actually tussle in combat and win so you're not really using the ambush as much to kill or to remove a unit as to just play it at the end of turn which seems kind of medium honestly you're not very happy about that the mastery is plus one more so if you're able to pump the attack in some form or fashion whether it's with a chant or a weapon or some kind of other way they could trigger mastery immediately then you're getting a four four for four but overall this card is kind of underperformed for me i actually put it at like a c minus uh you're still going to play your decks you're not unhappy about playing it and every once in a while it will take a unit but it's definitely not the removal spell on a stick that you would think it is so cult recruiter you get a c minus vine petal creeper is a 4-4 mandrake at common for five and a time so 4-4 four, for four, four, five pretty underwhelming muster plus four plus four and endurance this turn so it becomes an 8-8 eight, eight with endurance for this turn when you're able to muster I'll be honest with you, uh, the only time I played this card was in the pre-release event, and it did okay there, but that was the muster deck. This thing, I have it's never made any of my draft decks yet. It's just, there's so many better 4s, 5s, and 6s that you can be playing with, that most of the time, even when I have drafted this, I end up cutting it. So I'm, I'm not very excited about it. You're not going to have very many muster triggers on this thing. So yeah, I think Vine, keep, Vine Petal Creeper is just a D it'll make the deck sometimes but you're not happy about playing it there's just so many things in time that are competing for that time slot <laughs> pun intended all right moving right along one of the high or uh, show highlights of the format i guess i should say are all stars we have grodov's favored this is a six five giant at common for six and a time and summon you may silence another unit so this card is great this card is awesome uh i still don't think it's backbreaking uh well it might be a b minus in this format and i think it's because i'm giving extra value to the silence i there are very few times where i've played this card and felt like the silence just wasn't um wasn't efficient like it didn't do something the silence is quite relevant a lot of times you're taking out either an exalted unit or a flyer which is extremely relevant because of the fact that this thing has such a big body that it can also block very well most of the time your opponent has to send in two units to kill it uh, it six is not five but once again i think the stat line makes it quite good and honestly i am giving it hey i am i'm fine giving it a b minus i'll tell you why because it also is only a single time influence so a six drop with only a single influence means it's a lot easier to splash and like i said they typically sometimes you will lose because you play this big dumb unit and then they just get you with a flyer but the fact that this takes the flyer out of the out of the equation when it comes in is it, it, it just yeah i like it i think this card is overperformed for what you would expect it to be so grodoff's favorite you get a b minus from the jedi but just like mandrake is next this is a seven five mandrake at uncommon it is six time time for its cost it has overwhelm so that's good seven attack and overwhelm is solid you like that the last thing you, you you hate what you hate to see is have this big unit that can attack aggressively and then your opponent just sits there and blocks it with all the one one cultists and it has muster you gain five life this card is also good i think it's a decent finisher a pretty good finisher in time it comes up the board more than you would think five is a lot of health in this format it's not immense it's not unkillable but it is a lot and occasionally getting whenever you're able to muster this thing and gain the five life you just feel like you can't lose like your opponent you just hear their them groaning from across the the video game so i like majestic mandrake that being said though it is still just a c to me i think it's very interchangeable and the muster you're not going to trigger it as often as you think you will you will and like i said when you do you feel like you're king of the world and you just can't lose i do like the fact that it has overwhelm but five damage is not or five health is not completely invulnerable so it's somewhat easy to get off the board at times as well so majestic mandrake you get a c from me and our final card for time is going to be mountain goliath this is a four four giant at uncommon for seven time time so what a four four for seven that's got to be ridiculous but while mountain goliath is in your hand it gets a plus two plus two each time you draw another unit so should you have the unfortunate 
hand or rng to get this in your opening hand fear not at the very least it is going to get a plus two plus two every time you draw another unit draw not play so it will not count the the card the units that are in your hand that is something to consider uh, i have seen this card come down as a uh what 10 10 i think was the biggest i've seen it come down that being said sometimes you don't always get to 10 or 7 and of course also it does not have overwhelm which means that it can be chump blocked so i'm pretty medium on it i i'm not i i personally have not played it because i just value six and five drops a little bit more than i do seven seven is a lot chances of this coming down on actual turn seven are slim to none i think in most cases this is coming down closer to turn nine and let's be honest how often do you really get to turn nine so i'm pretty low on mountain goliath i'm going to give it an aggressive d plus uh, i just think it's too expensive and it's competing with other things you know best case scenario you have it in your opening or not yeah oh, best case scenario you have it in your opening hand so literally every unit you draw off of it so let's say let's say turn nine right so you have it in your opening hand turn nine you draw nine cards let's say you're on the draw so you draw nine cards of those nine cards five of your units right five and four because you're gonna draw power as well in there so best case scenario five cards you draw five units so then this thing's going to be a 14 14 that comes out on turn seven or turn nine so then it won't be able to attack to turn 10 and by that point your opponent's going to have a jump blocker or two to deal with it if not if they haven't been holding on to a removal spell yeah no mountain goliath you get a eh, you, you get a d plus you're going to win some games you know especially if you can like exalted give it flying and stuff like that but yeah you're still just going to be a d plus all right guys that's gonna do it for time some pretty good units in there uh, obviously we're seeing some synergy as well with the go wide uh, having a couple of cards that can make more than one unit a uh, little bit of muster representation but nothing i'm too excited about but not bad overall time looks pretty fun next faction up for review is justice and it looks like a doozy so first off right off the bat we have draw strength this is a fastball at common for one and a justice and if anyone has played in the preview pre-release draft format that we did just a little bit ago with dark frontier and flame azulta cards mixed in this card is a doozy it is deceptively good it is great at breaking board stalls give one of your units plus one plus one this turn for each enemy unit so what this means is that if your opponent has three units on the board and you attack and you use draw strength your unit will get a plus three plus three if they have one unit it gets a plus one plus one if it has a full board then it gets a plus 12 plus 12 for one power yes you can see how ridiculous this card is but there's more decimate the top three units of your deck get a plus one plus one this is great this card is awesome fits everywhere in the curve sometimes you decimate it sometimes you don't but it definitely turns your power extra power into a plus three plus three off the top of your deck should you get multiple these multiple of these off and you chain them so for example you get two of them and you decimate both now the top three cards of your deck get a plus two plus two that is just a huge snowball effect yeah draw strength is great it's a little bit easy to play around because they leave one power up it's on everyone's radar it's so powerful and you can simply count up how it plays out but the card is still insanely powerful it is a combat trick though so you still need units on the board but i think this card is a straight all around b it is super efficient in every which what shape or fashion i think i've come across one time and all the times i've had it where i wanted to play it but couldn't because the ratio of the plus ability wasn't correct you know like maybe i had three units and my opponent had one and the plus one wasn't enough but yeah this card is just absolutely fantastic so draw strength you are a b my friend Moving right along, we have a next uh, example of Exalted. We have Ghost Blade Outcast. This is a uncommon unseen for one in a green, and it is a 1-1. One -one. So 1-1 one -one for one, but at uncommon, that should give you something or let you know something. Typically, they value cards accordingly to their abilities, and they've obviously play tested. So the Exalted means that when Ghost Blade Outcast dies, it will at bare minimum give a plus one plus one and lifesteal to another unit which is great on a flyer great on a big unit uh, that in of itself is powerful enough and then obviously like we said it does combo with pump spells and other things 
So if you are able to draw strength this bad boy in a manner where it will still die, which is kind of tough because draw strength is awesome, but should you or have a weapon on it, then you're able to give the plus, like for example, let's say you just put the 2-2 sword on it. Now you're giving a plus three, plus three and lifesteal to another unit, which is huge. Yeah, this card's good. I like it. It's a lot and on, honestly a lot of times what i've found out is exalted is just keyword unblockable because most of the time especially at one unless you really get this thing's power up to about three most of the time the opponent's just gonna sit there and keep taking it they're like nope there's no way i'm letting you give something bigger um so yeah ghostblade outcast you are a c plus i like you i like it i think it's really good and chump blocks really well too obviously because it chump blocks and then gives something else life still i can get in there moving along we have an instance of a another instance of a removal in this format first one in a curse this is inflict conscience conscience this is a curse at common for one and a green so pretty easy to cast when the cursed unit deals damage kill it done deal doesn't matter <coughs> doesn't care how it did the damage it just cares that it did damage and then it dies so this goes really well on just a obviously a bigger unit or an evasive unit that you cannot block for example a flyer now they have to figure out because if it does damage to you like they attack they get in there it will die so that is the last attack it's going to have it will combos really well with reckless give something reckless then slap this on it so when it attacks it hits you in the face and then it dies that's really good as well if you're able to take the hit obviously but it also combos with the ghost blade outcast that we just saw because you can chump block with the outcast get the exalted trigger to put it on something else and whatever had the inflict conscience on it will die so quite strong that being said it the opponent gets to decide when they want to deal damage so i mean unless obviously you're able to fight so uh, a lot of times you might see the opponent like leave it back for defense now so they can get one good block out of it possibly trade with some of your units before it dies so that is something to consider and why it goes so well with reckless but yeah inflict conscience is pretty solid uh i'm having a hard time putting it uh, giving it a solid grade because i've seen it overperform i, I think it's a b minus i really do um it does kind of stink that you know your opponent has to like if they're because okay let's say best worst case scenario they have a bane wolf and you have an empty board and they're just swinging at you like you have to take seven to kill it to kill the wolf if you put inflict conscience on it but the fact that it's still going to kill the wolf or it stops it from attacking i think is a step in the right direction towards removal especially in such a light remo a removal light format so i'm going to take a chance here and put inflict conscience on a b minus but that being said i don't think you want a bunch of these in your deck i think two might be the most i've cut two before going down to one uh so it's probably one is the right number because sometimes it's gonna work out where you have a good board and you can block and sometimes you don't so inflict conscience you get a b minus with eh, some concern next up we have prancing griffin this card is a 1-1 one, one griffin at common for one and a green and it has flying that's it so one, one flyer for one nah. need a little more than that and let's see it has a summon effect you may give another unit flying this turn so onslaught is not in this form oh well, i mean it is on the format but it's not in this set so initially the one one flyers are good onslaught enablers but the summon ability give another unit flying is obviously way better late game it helps you trigger your masteries helps you um there's really no spark in the format uh, helps your bigger units later on kind of get in there break a board state which i'll talk about that later on in my hot takes but this card has seen some work it's gone up with value with me a little bit but not too high i still think very much long story short it is a c i don't think prancing griffin is insane in either direction so it's a c Moving on, we have Edict of Kodash. This is a slow spell at uncommon for two green. So two power, one justice. Silence a unit. All right, silence effects is relevant in this format. It gets rid of a flyer, gets rid of an exalted unit, lifesteal, et cetera, et cetera. I'm, by the end of it, I'm gonna be cutting all those parts kind of short, but if, and like I said, this is one of the, the green cycle of the color hosers. If it is fire or shadow, kill it. So you have a two color, just remove kill spell in justice. Granted, once again, I think the fact that silence is okay. It is not great, but silence is good and, or okay. And the, then it just straight up kills one of two units. Granted, I will say this, 
Uh, actually, well, it's not too bad because I would say it works against Shadow and Shadow has Immortalized, but it does silence the unit. I'm pretty sure it silenced. Now I have to remember how it worked. I do apologize. I'm almost positive it silences. If it's kill it. Yes, I'm almost positive it'll silence the unit and then it kills it. I don't think it kills it prior to the silence, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. So I, I don't remember now. I've, I've seen that interaction. I just don't remember. So I do apologize for that, guys. Yeah, I think Edicts, it's kind of tough because they're such, like, they're color specific. So you can easily go up against an Elysian deck and this just be a silence effect, which I think is fine. Uh, man, it's tough. I think I'm going to put it. I think I'm going to put it at a B minus because the silence is relevant. So I'm going to put it at a B minus, but it's probably closer to a C plus. But yeah, B minus for Edict of Kodash. Kodash Evangel is the 2-2 two, two for 2 double justice with lifesteal and fate gain a justice influence. And it is a common paladin cleric. Paladins have some synergy in this format, but not a lot. Clerics, not really. Uh, we already talked about more or less. I do think it's stronger than the time evangel because lifesteal is quite relevant, especially in the color with weapons. So yeah, either way, it's still just a C plus. Moving on, Crowd Queller. This is a relic weapon at common for plus two, plus one for three and a green. Okay, and not super exciting. Kind of reminds me of, uh, oh man, what is it? Spear, the uh, Librarian Spear. Oh, everyone's yelling the name at me now. Anywho, the two, one for two, but that was for two. This one is for three, and let's find out why. Spellcraft, three, so for six total, play a Flash Grenade. So Flash Grenade does synergize well with, with the actual weapon because it minus two, minus zero to an opponent's weapons and units. So it makes it to where Crowd Queller could potentially get two swings in. But paying six, it just, yeah, I don't like this card. You, you might play in some decks, but I don't like it. I, I, I think it's just paying three for two damage that kind of hits you two is kind of medium. It is removal. We are light, but I, I continue to cut this card from my decks. So, Crowd Queller, you get a D from me. Next up, we have Zoltan Paladin. This is a 3 2 Paladin at common for 2 and a Justice. And that's it. A vanilla 3 2 for 2. So, you're going up on stats a little bit, getting an extra power or attack where you usually would see a 2 2. And once again, kind of no Paladin, real real Paladin synergies. So it's just a body. I think it's fine. We'll put a C. It, it's good. It's a fine two drop. You don't mind taking it. That's it. Nothing much there. We'll move on. You'll want it in every deck. You'll play two, maybe even three of them if you need your two drop. So moving on. Sand, Stand Strong is a common spell, slow spell at two and a green. Give a unit plus three plus three and exalted this turn. So I have yet to find a scenario where this card is good. The reason being is that it is slow. Slow is so relevant about this spell because yes, you're giving the unit a plus three plus three. Yes, you're giving an exalted. Should it die, you get a big stat boost to another unit. Problem is your opponent can see this coming. So you let's say you know you you pump a, a small unit. Let's say you have a 4-4 four, four flyer, or 1-1 one, one flyer. Put this on it, you swing. Your opponent just takes four, or if they're really low in life, they chump block to where your flyer doesn't die. And then that's it. You did a plus three, plus three, and the exalted is irrelevant, and it goes away. If you slap this on, example, a large unit, right? You put this on, let's say, the, the Mandrake, the that's a little bit better it's probably best case scenario honestly because it has overwhelm right okay that's fine yeah so you, let's say you slap this on the mandrake once game same scenario your opponent can choose whether to allow it to get damage through or double block it to kill it or not block it at all or you know whatever i mean with the mandrake since it has overwhelm they would have to just not block it but let's say you put this on your Gorodos favored right so then all of a sudden this thing's a nine eight swinging in with exalted well they can just chump block with a one one or a two two and that's it so i'm really low on this card i almost want to say it's an f almost i i think in a sack deck like if you have ways of sacking your own units then you can play this and then sack the unit at the end of turn to get the bonus so there is that but yeah so since stand strong you are getting a d Moving right along, we have Forge Mark Scrivener. 
This is a 2-3 Oni at Uncommon for 3 and a Justice. It has Mastery 2, play a plus 1, plus 2 weapon on one of your other Oni. So it does not play the weapon on itself, and it only plays it on an Oni. So it will not play it on a Paladin unless it's an Oni Paladin. So obviously it gets Mastery as soon as it blocks or attacks one time and survives. So that's somewhat relevant, right? And there's some good Onis in this format, I'm not going to lie. We'll talk about one in a minute. And then Mastery 6, so if it gets in there minimum three times, it could get buffed by a Sandstrong or something like that to get in extra damage. Mastery 6, play a plus one, plus two weapon on each of your Oni. So that does include itself and the Oni that it gave the weapon to earlier and any others that might have joined the battlefield with it. This card seems okay. The... Uh, once again, the 2-3 stats make it a little difficult to kind of tussle in combat quite well in this format so far. I know some other people are higher on it. Just every time I've seen it, both on my side of the board, on the opposite, it's been kind of medium. So I'm going to give you a medium grade and Forge Mark Scrivener, you get a C. Just fine. It's fine, playable. I'm not going to knock you for putting it in your deck. Moving right along, we have Hex Caster. This is a 2-2 Mage at Uncommon for three and a green when you play a curse draw a justice sigil from your deck so this is this is good it, this is good if you guys remember the lathrai courtier from the previous two formats ago where when you played a relic you drew a a uh, sigil from your deck that's quite powerful so i'm going to give this card a b if you are in the curse deck if you are not it's probably it is a c the reason why i say that is because obviously you want to be able to trigger this i think probably two times is where you're happy one is fine but two is really where you feel like you're getting your money back because of the fact that it is a three three for two so you're getting understated over costed but once it pays for itself twice, like you get two sigils, you essentially do two cards. I think it's quite powerful. It does clean up your draws somewhat because you are taking power off your deck. And typically, if you are the Argent Port, maybe the Huru deck, or yeah, Huru or Argent Port deck, then you're going to have multiple curses to trigger this. So yeah, I'm going to give Hexcaster a B if you're heavy curses and C if you're not. But I do like this card. I think it's it's gotten me out of a pinch quite a few times when I get stuck on low power. So I like Hexcaster. Next up we have Nivia's 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 Inquisitor. This is a 2-2 Paladin at Uncommon for three and a justice. When you decimate your power, Nivia's Inquisitor gets a plus two plus two. So of note, it is anytime you decimate so it does not have to be uh she does have to be in play the inquisitor does have to be in play he actually looks like a he uh but at any point whenever you draw strength or you uh shoot souls rest take an extra any time you decimate it gets a plus two plus two which can prove to be okay you decimate one time this is a four four a three a four four for three so you're you're feeling pretty good about that you decimate this thing twice uh, that's that's really good. It combos really well with draw strength because of the fact that you can decimate draw strength when you play it. So it's hard for your opponent to do combat math because they're like, okay, do you draw strength this? Do you draw strength another unit? Because obviously it will still get the plus two plus two. It has some more text. It has mastery twelve. So that's a lot. But double Nivia's Inquisitor. Nivia's Inquisitors attack and health so if you're able to mastery this while you have a pump spell on it this thing gets absolutely ginormous but let's just say you mastery you decimate once it's a 4-4 you get in there three times and then it becomes an 8-8 this card's good i like it that being said if you don't have decimate it, it loses a lot of its excitement so and 12 is a lot getting 12 damage with a card is pretty difficult unless you have a busted turn so i'm gonna give nivia's inquisitor a c plus i think it's a c plus is a good spot for it let's keep traveling down the line guys bearing with me we're doing pretty good doing pretty good right now next up we have one of my personal favorites so far oni stalwart this is a one of four oni at common for three and justice it has endurance so one four endurance is awesome you can attack almost just about any time you want and of course it'll stay back on defense but here's the other bonus of it having endurance it has a mastery four get a plus two plus two that's right so you can be triggering mastery on this thing both on attack and defense this thing is so good 
And of course, like we talked about earlier, the four health is a good staple in this format. Mastery four, it gets a plus two, plus two. So it becomes a three, six, which makes this thing a complete house. Like, oh my God, what a wall. I've been on both sides of this thing triggering mastery and it's just so good. It This card is really good. I, I, I like it quite a lot. I think it's gonna be doing a lot of things. It blocks really well. And of course your opponent can't just like chump attack into it because it's like, you know, you'll still be triggering the mastery and working up to it. So that makes them kind of question that a little bit as well. And it's a three drop that forces them to use tricks early, which is always nice because it means less tricks for your top deck or for your, your bigger stuff. So yeah, Oni Star Wars, you get a C plus from the Jedi. Next up, this one's really good, actually, to be honest with you. It's probably going to be, oh, man, I don't know. All right, so Seasoned Drill Master is a 3-3 Minotaur at Uncommon for 3 and a Justice. <laughs> seasoned Drill Master has a summon effect. Give one of your other units a plus 3, plus 3 this turn. That is really good, and I'll tell you why. Because if you play it on 3, your 2-drop is typically going to get in for 5. So, I mean, that's kind of free damage. And then because of the fact that it is just a three drop, when you draw it late, you're like, well, this kind of stinks. I really don't care about, you know, a three drop on turn eight, but actually you kind of do because plus three plus three is yet again a lot. So it might be enough to get your big unit in, it might be able to get some extra damage in with a flyer. So this card is really good in all stages of the game. Uh, it's a little little lackluster in board stalls obviously because they might have enough blockers but even then if your opponent is anywhere near low life you throw this on your biggest unit you swing and you're probably gonna get a two for one maybe even a three for one out of it or at the very least a chump blocker so yeah i like drill master i think season drill master does a lot of work i think it is good all the way up the curve you know worst case scenario you play this on turn five with no good units to capitalize on the plus three plus three but I think that I think the floor is not low enough and the ceiling is high enough to where this card is really good. So season drill master, you get a C plus. Next up we have Storm of Feathers. This is a slow spell at common for three justice justice. It says stun two enemy units. Okay, that, that's fine. That's a pseudo flash freeze, just slow spell right what's the other one the warp one entangling mines i guess but decimate you gain four armor so obviously the cool thing about this is the fact that it synergizes well with relic weapons right because typically you have to engage when you play your relic weapon to get your two for one to make sure your opponent can't crack back and kill the weapon after you use it right well the fact that you're able to stun two units and get the four armor additional armor means that there's two ways on one card for your relic weapon to stay around so this card's all right this card's okay that being said not super high on it uh and i haven't been super excited to put in my decks just yet i haven't really seen too many relic weapons i'm like windmill slamming so i actually think storm of feathers is a d but it has the potential probably d plus yeah i think d plus is fine for it um a slow spell stun is a little bit harsh like you kind of need to be either stabilized or kind of winning a little bit it can buy you some time if you're losing it draws it gives you like one extra turn so that seems kind of medium so yeah storm of feathers you get a d plus from the jedi cleansing rain this one is interesting i'm kind of still on the fence about this one guys so cleansing rain is a fast spell at uncommon for green green you and your units gain aegis decimate kill all enemy curses so i in in it sounds like a blowout but in all honesty it's probably just an expensive way of negating one of your opponent's removal spells and it has to be specifically a removal spell not a pump spell or a killer because it just gives your unit ages so obviously it gives all your units ages while the one that was being targeted pops the ages but hey at least the unit survives the decimate yeah if you're going up against a curse synergy deck then that's just backbreaking so i've ran two decks with one each in them you definitely don't want two of these and both times they were kind of medium uh, i think maybe it's a limited thing like maybe in constructed does a lot more work i'm not completely sure so i think it's still a little too narrow and then four is not something you can leave up very often D you know this is very much a late game play so yeah cleansing rain you get a d Next up, we have Mistrust. Mistrust, 
This is a uncommon cursed relic for four and a green. When the cursed player plays a unit, sacrifice mistrust to play two, three, two paladins. So I like this card right off the bat. Why? Because you're getting two units for the price of one card. And the fact is that limited is typically controlled by predominantly units. I think that this one triggering when your opponent plays a unit is quite good, even if it's late. Like obviously if you play it later, the harder, you know, less likely are to play a unit, but at the end of the day, they will always continue to play units because that's what limited is about. So yeah, I like mistrust a lot. It synergizes with the curse decks. It gives you units, two units for one, plus they're relevant bodies. You're breaking even essentially as far as cost goes because obviously we just saw the three two zoltan paladin is a two cost so you're not getting up on mana or power at all you know it'd be different if that was a three cost unit then you're up two power but and your opponent does somewhat get to decide when they get to pop it but sometimes they don't sometimes you have enough pressure and they have to play a unit and you're just adding pressure to the board so yeah mistrust is great mistrust is the units aren't evasive though so i don't think it's a b plus i think i'm gonna put mistrust at a c plus yeah and it's easy to be splashable so yeah mistrust you get a c plus the other one that we're going to talk about in shadow i do think is probably closer to b territory but we'll get there yeah mistrust you are a c plus home stretch we're almost done with justice guys next up we have rent seeker this is a three three paladin at common for four green green so double justice as mastery six play a curse of taxation on the enemy player curse of taxation is the curse that goes on a player where they have minus one maximum power yeah that's i've never seen that card played literally ever and i don't think it'd be played in limited either especially with this thing having to deal damage twice uh, i don't like three three for four so i think this is going to be one of your last playables should you need it i'm not super excited about playing it and of course the mastery doesn't give any stat bonus either is literally just the curse of taxation so rent seeker you are a d i do not like you next up another limited all-star long tail calvary this is a unseen kieran at uh two one unseen kieran at common for five justice justice so flying and exalted yeah this card's great this card is awesome i'm gonna give it a b minus the reason why i say that is because giving a unit evasion is huge like there's so many times where this card just stops all attacks on you because they don't want to kill it to give your biggest unit flying and there are times where it could just continuously get in for two because your opponent's not going to block it if they do have a blocker or kill it in the air because then they immediately have to deal with something else being bigger and being able to fly in there so this thing typically is going to sit on the board until they can eat it with a have an answer to either the weapon it makes or silence it so this card is really good granted playing a 2-1 on 5 is kind of underwhelming so you want to have a little bit of a board state so but i am going to give this card a b minus i think it's strong enough it is double justice so you're not splashing it but i've seen this card just completely change the dynamic of a game when it comes down like on both sides of the board so i think this card is valuable enough and will help you close out the game and changes removal and stuff like that to where it's impactful enough where it is a b minus i like long tail cavalry yeah it's a it's a b minus for me i do see some downsides where obviously on a standalone an empty board it's a horrible five drop uh, if you don't have a board presence so there is some issues but i think the ceiling on this card is good enough to where it does change and warp the board state to give it a higher value i like this card a lot and it goes by surprisingly late, but i think it's because of the double justice all right guys the last card for justice is kodash sees all and i see myself eventually building around this card but as of right now it's too early in the format for me to do it this is a cursed relic at uncommon for seven justice justice at the start of the cursed player's turn play a griffin with flying and and uh, attack and health equal to the number of curses on the cursed player and their unit so long story short it counts all curses that you've played both on their units and their on themselves to make you a griffin so you are getting at the start of the cursed player's turn so on the start of their turn you are getting a blocker there is some relevance that you get to trigger it right away and bare minimum you play this let's say 
best case scenario you play this thing on seven and they have no you have no other curses on the board you're going to get a one one flying griffin at the start of their turn as a chump blocker that seems okay but it's still once we said getting to seven this is turn nine or eight you know ten maybe getting a one one flyer doesn't seem that impressive let's say what are you like in best case scenario what you're talking about three curses counting this so you have like a permafrost maybe a torture and then this or maybe a blood of Macar. So you're getting a free 3-3 flyer at the start of their turn. That seems okay in a stalled board state. I mean, obviously having something like Blood of Makar might be good because at least the Griffin gets bigger, but that still seems so mediocre for seven. Like you need this thing to make like two four fours or three three threes for this to be worth it. Yeah, I just, I don't think so. Kodosh sees all might be, I think it's my, still even a build around D because of the fact that it's seven. I mean, I want to take and say that Direwolf play tested it some, and they, you know, being cheaper was too powerful. So, but yeah, Kodosh sees all. You're you're probably a D, and even if you're a build around, if you're like the Argent Port deck, and you have a bunch of big guys to come up the floor, then maybe this thing bumps up to like a, a C plus or B minus because of the fact that it could eventually win the game. But I'm hard pressed to see that, guys. But all right, that's Justice. I think Justice has some pretty powerful cards and some pretty lackluster cards. Uh, there are plenty of Cs I gave out, like solid Cs, so I think it's C pluses. So I think in the mid range, uh, Justice is going to be quite strong. Draw Strength and the Long Tail Cavalry really help throw that card over the top. So yeah, Justice seems good to me. Moving into Primal, guys, we have Icy Gaze. This is a fast spell at un or at common for one and a Primal stun an enemy unit okay that works we learned from fend off that that's actually quite relevant the fact that it cancels out combat sometimes eats up a removal spell buys you a little bit of time makes it quite well and like we learned with metal and gather strength the fact that or draw strength i'm sorry the fact that it is one power to play means it's quite flexible also has additional text if a primal but if you just have a primal influence, if Icy Gaze is discarded, play it from your void. So, uh, you know, the self mill thing, and that's uh, it's not bad. I, I have yet to build the self mill deck, but I can see there have been times where I've milled cards. And I'm like, man, I really would have liked to play that. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of insurance. Granted, the, the card itself is not high impact either. It does combo well if you're able to mill yourself at fast speed which is there, there are some ways of doing that overall i think this card is pretty medium um it's probably a c minus honestly uh like i said the fact that it can cancel out a combat trick so if you end up blocking and your opponent does a con like it's a favorable block for you you block and then your opponent does a combat trick to kill your unit you can essentially icy gaze it to take it out of combat and negate their their spell so it's kind of a one for one i guess so that seems okay so yeah i'll give icy gaze a c minus Next up, we have a Snowstorm Druid. This is a 1 1 Druid at Uncommon. Snowstorm Druid costs 1 and a Primal. It has Flying and Summon. You gain Aegis. Muster, stun an enemy unit. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of low on this card. The getting a Face Aegis seems more of a constructed thing for me than limited. Uh, it does prevent curses from going on you, like Blood of Makar and. Uh, unkindness things like that or uh, mistrust like we just talked about but that being said there are plenty of times where you go up against the deck where this just doesn't really matter all that much either there's not a lot of discard in this format as far as opponents trying to mill you out a little bit i mean there is a mill deck but still just to attach that to a 1-1 flying body it carries equipment well the muster seems okay but like i said i'm not very high on muster right now just because of the fact that you're very limited to how many times you can activate it and obviously playing a spell and a attachment the same turn sometimes may not be the most beneficial or strategically sound thing for you to do so yeah i'm kind of low on it i'm giving snowstorm druid a d all right we have our primal edict here in the form of edict of lin ray lin ray uh is a or edict of lin ray is an uncommon slow spell for two primal stun an enemy unit all right if it's fire or time transform it into a zero one totemite and then stun it instead i think this card is strong as well because of the fact that okay fine stun is not that exciting especially at slow speed that's pretty underwhelming 
but the fact that it can essentially uh, kill for all intents and purposes a fire or justice unit or fire or time unit which i think have some of the beefier units makes this quite good um like i said the stun you're not super happy about but against two different factions they'll end up doing some work as we saw there were a couple of both time or fire multi-faction cards that were quite powerful as well so i actually think edict of linray is quite good so i'm actually gonna put it at man it's so hard to say though because you know there's three factions where this is just not gonna straight do anything really relevant like i said stun at slow speed is just not impressive i think i'm gonna go ahead and put it at a c plus i think c plus might be a safe rating for the edicts because they're quite powerful when i mean you know obviously when you're going it's a two two cost kill spell when you're going up against time or praxis or any of that combination so that seems really strong but then the fact that it's two out of three Ugh, it's tough like i said I pr probably c plus i could see this being a b minus as well let me know in the comments below what you guys think of the edicts so maybe a c a b minus just because of the fact that it just straight up kills something and time has a lot of big problematic units and fire has a lot of berserk units all right next up we have pock Pox slingshot this is a plus one plus three weapon at uncommon it does have a spellcraft but the weapon itself costs two and a primal and the spellcraft is two so four total to play a snowball deal one damage so on the surface i would say this isn't that powerful but we've already established that 25 percent of the field will have or has a potential of being an x1 so snowball has actually gone up in value being somewhat a two power kill spell obviously that being on a spellcraft weapon means that it also triggers muster and the one three is a decent stat line for two like it could definitely add some power to some things where it can get in there especially on a fly or something like that i like pop box single shot i think i'll probably put it at a c plus yeah a c plus seems fair i like it i think once again if the snowball was less impactful i'd give it a lower grade but the fact that the snowball will end up doing some work i kind of like it it actually goes up a little bit in value of course with the uh muster all right moving right along we have numbing cold this is a cursed relic at uncommon for two and a primal and when the cursed player plays a spell sacrifice numbing cold to negate it yep this card is just an f straight up yes it gives you a, uh, a relic yes it gives you a curse yes it negates a, an opponent's spell but the opponent gets to decide what spell it negates because they see it coming so they can literally just hold their really good spell in their hand until yeah i just it's not going to work the way you want to every once in a while they'll have like the cut ties in their hand and no other spell so they literally can't play the cut ties till this breaks but yeah i'm not feeling it numbing cold you are an f moving right along linray evangel which is the evangel for primal 2-2 two, two, yeti cleric at common for two primal primal it has overwhelm as its battle skill and fate gain a justice influence or jeez correction sorry primal influence gain a primal influence and just to make sure because i don't remember what i just said it is two primal primal yeah c plus they're great they're fixing their solid bodies we like them moving right along sky watch zealot this is a zero three cultist at uncommon plus two plus or i'm sorry the cost two and a primal has exalted so giving a plus zero plus three to a unit isn't very exciting and a dragon ally draw a card yeah i don't think this card is that impressive to be completely honest with you the zero three with no real upside except replacing itself when you play a dragon seems pretty medium to me let's go skywatch zealot you get a d i just the the exalted trigger giving three i mean obviously the trick is to slap a better weapon on this and make it a lot more relevant but i, I feel like now you're kind of in magical christmas land type thing where you're trying to get three things to happen you're trying to play a dragon and draw a card off of it and then play a weapon on it to make it better and then have it die so it can make something else even better like man eh, no it just doesn't you know let's say you put once again the two plus two plus two uh, justice weapon on it then it's just a two five which is okay but like yeah no skyward zealot you get a d from the jedi moving right along we have yeti griffin rider this is a 1-1 one, one yeti griffin at common cost two and a primal it has flying it has berserk and then mastery three get a plus one plus one 
So when it gets in three times, presumably you can hit it once and then hit Berserk, or you can just hit it three times, etc., etc., or pump it one time. It gets it becomes a two-two bird for two, which is decent. It's pretty good. It has evasion. It has Berserk, which obviously we know on flyers is really good because if you can pump it really big for a turn, you can get in for a lot of damage. I think it's serviceable. The I would like a little more stats on it, maybe a one-two, but obviously this thing can kill your opponent very quickly if you're able to buff it for a turn. Uh, Skycrag does have some ways of adding extreme amounts of power. Like for example, you slap a dramatic uh, exit on this thing. All of a sudden it gets in for 10 if you had Berserk. So it gets a plus four, plus zero and Exalted. It gets in for 10, then when it dies, which obviously you see will trigger the Mastery. So actually it gets in for 11. Trigger Mastery, it gets pumped up, then it dies. And you're gonna give another unit flying Berserk and uh what let me see so five six six one six three yeah that seems pretty good yeti griffin's not too bad i give it a c i think it is absolutely fine brutish interloper is a two four warrior at uncommon for three and a primal so normally we'd be all right two four for three seems pretty serviceable right except it has reckless and believe it or not that makes the world of difference i feel this card is pretty bad because of reckless let's continue though mastery six so it somehow deals six damage plus one plus one and overwhelm so after six damage it becomes a three five still has reckless though and then mastery 12 so it deals 12 damage somehow it gets a plus three plus three and berserk which then means that, let's see, so it'd be a 3-5, so it becomes a 6-8 with Berserk and Overwhelm, which seems pretty solid, but it has Reckless. It only has two attack. So your opponent's going to almost immediately chump block it or double block it to get off the board and or just play a bigger unit that can kill it. Yeah, you have to really kind of go in on the plan of playing Brutish Interloper and then having the tricks and the removal to keep it alive multiple times, and that just doesn't seem a thing. I'm off of it. Brutish Interloper, you're D. Moving right along, we have Cruelty. This is a slow spell at un or at common for three and a primal. Play Inferiority Complex on an enemy unit. So Inferiority Complex, for those of you that don't know, is the cursed unit is Reckless. So obviously it attacks every turn when it has to, or whether it wants to or not, it has to attack. And if you decimate, so pay one, of, one maximum power, deals two damage to it. So it has uh, the ability of triggering, uh, actually I believe it triggers on its own, it triggers muster, because it's a spell and then it plays an attachment. So I'm almost positive this triggers muster on its own. And then you have the option of it also being a kill spell for something that is X2. Um, or, you know, after damage and stuff. So there's multiple utilities to cruelty. I think it's okay. I'm not super high on it, but I think it's fine. Uh, actually, you know what? I actually haven't really taken it that high. I think I've played it in one of my decks thus far. Uh, Infury Complex can be a removal spell, as we saw from the coin, the primal coin from last set. So sure, I'll give Cruelty a C-, minus, but you're not super happy about picking it. And, I mean, sometimes they'll kill a unit, sometimes it won't. I don't know. Next up, we have Greed's Reward. Greed's Reward is a fast spell at common for three and a primal. It says deal one damage to an enemy. Yeah, pretty lackluster. Initially, I'd be pretty quickly off of this, but there is Decimate. Draw a card for each damage Greed's Reward dealt. So what this means is off the cuff, if you right off the bat, if you Decimate, it'll deal one damage, hopefully kill one of those X ones, and then draw you a card which is okay. Like it still costs you a power, a maximum power to do it. The benefit out of this card is when you're able to deal additional damage. And that's one of the things I did not look at. I know there's obviously that one Yeti that the was in Crone, that gives it a plus one. So this would be pay three at fast speed, deal two damage, draw two cards and decimate obviously. So it goes up in value a little bit there. That being said, I still think it requires a little bit of setup. Uh, it's okay, it's serviceable because of how many X1s there are, but I'm not uber excited about this, so I'd put Greed's Reward at a D. You'll play it, but you're not super excited. Um, it, obviously, if you have multiple ways of increasing the damage of spells through rares and crones and stuff like that, and lens, the whatever lens, this goes up in your deck, but you're, you know, I don't know if that's... You're, 
feel like especially the lens just being kind of like a do nothing relic meh yeah d's reward your d and maybe a build around d minus maybe i don't know or d plus i'm sorry all right next up rainfall accord this is a fast spell at common for three primal draw two cards then discard a card so you are essentially breaking even the reason why i say this is because you played rainfall of accord which is a card to draw two so you're technically up one and then you discard a card so you're back down to spending two cards for two this is uh it's not card va uh card oh shoot card advantage no, sorry there you go i don't know why i kept wanting to say uh card evaluation or something like that it is card filtering if you will card selection so if you have for example an extra power in your hand that you don't need you can draw two additional cards and then pitch the power to you know essentially filter cards or uh sculpt your hand to be better so it's fine it, it could also muster trigger etc etc it is a fastball so you can leave up a combat trick and then if nothing happens you can rain fall of accord rainfall of accord or rainfall accord sorry guys rainfall accord so i think it's fine it's a c i think it's okay it's not great but you're not down on cards either i could see it helping you get to your power early and help you uh, pitch your power late so sure moving right along we're at thunderclaw raven this is a 2-1 bird at common for three and a primal as flying so eh, kind of medium but i guess it's serviceable mastery six draw a curse of your choice from your deck okay okay so if you're the cursed deck you kind of get a card back after this thing hits three times which could be possible considering it has flying which is solid evasion so this could be a thing i still think with all the things that can kill one toughness or one health things uh, obviously as soon as they play anything in the air you're not able to attack with this guy so i'm not super high on him uh it's probably closer to c minus i guess it, it depends on your quality of spells to make sure this guy gets in there as well as what kind of curses you're wanting to get back because there is a chance that you might be able to trigger mastery off this guy and you don't have a curse in the void oh wait draw a curse of your choice from your deck oh, okay so tutoring never mind i'm sorry for some reason i thought it was the one that gets it back from the void but now i think that's an uncommon uh in the curia pack so i do apologize about that so just to clarify mastery six draw a curse of your choice from your deck so yeah i mean eh, it's still kind of lackluster if you have an awesome curse once again it works it's like a free tutor but it does have to get in there i think it's fine we'll put it as a c thunderclaw raven's a c maybe even a c minus but we'll go with c for right now next up we have tide collar which is a 3-3 cultist shaman at uncommon for three and a primal so your stereotypical three drop which is perfect like that already has muster play a 4-4 living wave with charge sacrifice it at the end of the turn uh, i think this card's good i, I like it uh, monster once again is difficult to make but the fact that you're getting a 4-4 that can bash right away before it dies seems pretty good i mean obviously you're just gonna swing it's like a free unit sometimes it gets in four time four damage sometimes it's not i think the fact that the baseline is, is just a three three for three seems pretty good so i like tight collar tight collar is a pretty solid c with upside i like it <clears throat> moving along we have fear stroker raven this is a zero five bird at uncommon interesting let's see what this has cost of four and a primal and fear stroker raven has flying and it also says at the end of each turn if a player discarded a card fear stroker raven gets a plus two attack permanently so okay all right on the surface i think this card is somewhere about a d plus c minus maybe probably a d honestly because a zero five flyer doesn't really do all that much but the fact that it can somewhat naturally pump itself and like i've said before we did see that one raven on uh the felon raven that makes them discard a card or discard two cards when it attacks and there's malaise and there's some other kind of incidental mills like the shadow three three that we that we're gonna see that will mill as well i think this has potential of coming up the board early and then getting in for some attacks as like a four or five later this card's actually pretty good uh that being said you do want some discard in your deck if you have no discard at all this is it probably really close to a d minus 
So I think I'll probably meet in the middle and put this thing at a, so no, we'll do that. If you have no mill in your deck, it is a D. If you have mill in your deck or some kind of discarding effects, then it goes up to just a C. So take your pick which way it would go. But I mean, I think that's really the best way to evaluate it. Next up, we have rever reverberating strike. This is a fastball at common for four primal. Deal one damage to each enemy. So it is one-sided, so it will leave your X1s alive. Like we talked about, there are going to be a lot more X1s in this format than usual. That being said, I don't know if I want to spend four power to kill two X1s because at the same time, X1s are typically weak. There's not any like bomb legendary X1s. So I think this card is pretty medium. It's probably designed to combo off with, once again, things like the Crone and the Lens to deal more damage. As of right now, I do not think that is a solid archetype. I think it re might require a little too so much setup. I mean, granted, if you do one, it deals two damage to everything on your opponent's board, which could be relevant. It is also only on your opponent's board. That being said, I still think it's one of the last inclusions you put into your deck. So I'll put Reverberating Strike as a D. Now I'm getting my word. Someone's going to make the spell deck with like three lenses and two crones and just go to town on all these cards. Next up, this leads us up to Yeti Traditionalist. This is a 3-3 Yeti at common for four primal primal. It has overwhelm and it has muster plus two plus two. So if you trigger muster one time, this thing becomes a 5-5 five, five overwhelm for four. Seems pretty good. Then of course, if you muster off of a spellcrafted weapon and put the weapon on this guy, then he's just huge and overwhelm, which is always a great thing. I think this card is solid. I think it's a solid C. Uh, the overwhelm is really what puts it over for me. I mean, obviously paying a 3-3 for paying 4 for a 3-3 is very underwhelming, but the fact that if you trigger muster one time, this guy is already kind of overvalue, then I think is quite good. And then it carries weapons well, once again, as well as pump spells because of the overwhelm. So I think out of all the 3-3s for 4, this is one of the best ones, if not the best one. Moving right along to home stretch, we're almost done, guys. Almost done. We have a green stretch empath. This is a three five druid for uh, or un uncommon three five druid at uncommon for five and a primal. So just one primal, easy to splash, and muster draw two cards. So it's a th vanilla three five for five, which is not very exciting. It's a good blocker. Don't get me wrong. Three damage, like we extend it stated, is will kill the majority of commons and uncommons in this format, and five health will keep it alive during most cases, which is already solid. But the fact that if you muster, you're able to draw two cards, that's huge, guys. Like drawing two cards essentially for free or making your muster effect free or replacing it rather is awesome. I think this card is one of the major, major payoffs for muster. So I think you'd be comfortable taking this at any point. So I'm actually gonna put it at a, at a B minus. I just really think drawing cards and it being able to gum up the board with its body is just great. And then heaven forbid you're mustering once again off of a weapon or you're putting the attachment on this guy. So this guy's just big. Yeah, I like this card. I, I think I'm giving, I'm being a little lenient on these Bs, B minuses, uh, just because like, uh, I've, I mean, Grant, we give a ton of Cs, and I, I know that, but I don't know, like this card, I've, I've used it twice in draft, and I just felt good just activating one time, and the games were activated it more than one time, like I just felt like I couldn't lose. Like you're up four cards on your opponent, and you're typically doing something with the spell and the curse or the attachment that you're playing, whether it's a weapon, a relic weapon, or a curse. So yeah, I like Green Stretch Empath quite a bit. I think the fact that the body is solid, whether you trigger muster or not, really helps helps it go over but the muster is just awesome next up we have one of the front runners as all-star for this is sky horror draconis this is a four five nightmare dragon at common for seven and a primal it has flying okay so stats are a little low but that's fine that's fine because it has mastery five so this thing deals five damage and obviously we've talked about sky crag and and uh Felon have ways of upping its attack by one in several ways. You are able to trigger this mastery in one, just one attack or one block. Play a permafrost on an enemy unit. So this thing is a removal spell on a stick, which happens to also be one, a somewhat unconditional. Obviously, if they have endurance, it won't work. But for all intents and purposes, and permafrost in this format is un unconditional removal. And two, it's a curse, which triggers 
both cursed things as well as possible muster. So this Sky Dragon or Dracon Sky Horror Draconis is awesome. I like this card quite a bit. It is a C plus for me. It is a seven drop, so you have to make sure you get there. But some games have proven to be slow. All right, Rose Bloom Mandrake is the final card here, and this is the six six Mandrake at common for eight. And a primal so we are not excited about this it does have overwhelm but still don't really want to pay eight for an overwhelm six six but rose bloom mandrake costs six less so it's cost two while the enemy player has 10 or more cards in their void so i will not lie to you i have been on the receiving end of turn two mana uh, malaise turn three malaise turn four two drop and rose bloom mandrake so that is a thing but even then like that doesn't seem too scary does it and sure enough wasn't like the the mandrake attacked one time and then i had enough blockers for it to not attack again so yeah i don't think this card is very great at all i think there's plenty of finishers especially sky horror draconis rosebloom mandrake you get a d and that's it guys that is going to do it for primal primal is, is interesting i think there's some there's some cards that you're definitely excited to play and they kind of go in every format there's some evasion some berserk I do think it's going to be interesting to see how the muster plays out as Primal seem to have the stronger muster payoffs versus time. We'll see how that plays out. Primarily, of course, once again, I really liked the whole uh, green stretch empath. But yeah, guys, that's going to do it for Primal. All right, Shadow starts us off with Edict of Makar. So this is the Shadow Edict, of course. It is a slow spot uncommon for one and a shadow. The enemy unit of your choice can't block this turn. Super medium. If it's time or justice, kill it. So it is a removal spell for two factions and, or two and a half, I guess, if you count multi-faction cards. And then the effect is super medium. Not having their best blocker not be able to block seems super, super medium, uh, if not low impact. Yeah, I think this is a C minus. And the only reason why it's not going into the D range is just the fact that if you need a playable and sometimes it's gonna be able to straight up kill something, and those are two of the more primary or popular colors in the format. So it's hard for me to straight up give it a D, but I'm not super excited for it. So it's a C minus moving right along we have faceless one this is a 2-1 cultist at common for one and a shadow as faceless one can't block all right i really despise that text on a unit to be completely honest with you guys if you have a shadow influence if faceless one is discarded play it from your void so it is one of those like hey if you accidentally milled this or you milled it on purpose etc you get it for free but let's just face it 2-1 doesn't really battle that well and even for free and it can't block so it's not even a chump blocker so yeah faces one you're an f i don't like it i i i think i might have put it in one deck because i was shy on units maybe and man i was super unhappy about playing it so yeah faces one you are an f i don't like it i don't think it should be played to be completely honest with you because it doesn't, it doesn't even attack well pretty much half the twos and every three can block this thing moving right along we have fervent siphoner this is oh the artwork is super cool i never really focused on the artwork wow it's like choke holding a minotaur and then it's draining all its energy so it's spark oh it's super cool i want to see what that looks like in premium anywho this is a one two cultist at common for two and a shadow it has exalted all right so not amazing stats but let's see when the player discards when a player discards a card so a player so either you or your opponent fervent siphoner gets a plus one attack this turn so uh discards a card huh i wonder i have to double check if this thing because i haven't played this card but now i'm wondering if you play for example we'll get into it now but there's a three three that mills both players for three i wonder if this thing gets a plus six plus O. If that's the case, it might not be too bad because then obviously that's something that your opponent may not want to chump block or block for it to die because then you're giving, you know, for example, plus seven, plus two to another unit. So there might be some value in here. That being said, once again, you need to play another card for it to be temporarily okay for a turn. Um, obviously when you combo it with like malaise, again, a plus six, plus zero. So it can have some upside. Uh, the exalt is really what kind of helps it for me honestly 
just the fact that that's going to be a tough trade for your opponent because like what we saw with uh, the profit from last angry profit from the last format the fact that a lot of times they it traded up but you know they just got off the board as soon as they could uh, i'll probably just give fervent siphoner a c i think i'm all right with that moving right along we have one of our powerhouse cards this is immortalized I, this i'm a fan favorite or this is one of my fan favorites this is a fastball at common for two and a shadow draw a unit from your void so a slightly uh, you're paying one more for this to be a I guess dark returned at fast speed but minus the plus one plus one but decimate so pay met one maximum power it gets exalted I feel like this card is super powerful reason being is it happens at fast speed so you can wait till at the very end of your opponent's turn to get a unit back also, if you have some kind of shenanigans, you know, this is more for constructive, but using like Destiny or Revenge, you can do this to kind of draw a card. And then, of course, being able to give any unit exalted is absolutely backbreaking, to be honest with you. You're never unhappy when you cast a spell because if you do it with a smaller unit, let's say they kill your 2 2 flyer. Well, you bring it back, so you get your 2 2 flyer back, but it also has exalted. So now when they kill it, you're going to be able to give something else flying. You, you know, you can bring back a blood wolf. So that we'll talk about here in a moment where it's a two, three life steal. So you're getting back, an, you're getting back another two, three life steal. And then should it die, you get to give something else two plus two plus three in life steal. So yeah, and, and then heaven forbid, you should immortalize one of your bombs. You uh, immortalize, for example, Bane Wolf. It's funny because let's talk about one of the cards I haven't brought up or we talked about already. So you bring back the um, Grodov's Favored now it's a six five with silence so it silences something else when it comes back into play and should they kill it you get to give us plus six plus five to another unit that makes an instant bomb yeah immortalize is great this card is awesome i give it a b i like it a lot immortalize you are a b obviously downside will be if you have nothing in your void or even getting a two two back but at the same time you're getting a chump blocker so in worst case like i said you draw it and you have no units in your void or you're unable to decimate it but even if you're unable to decimate it you could still just play it to get your best card back next up we have a makar evangel obviously the shadow evangel this is a two two for two elf cleric at common and it costs two shadow shadow it has quick draw which is good that combos really well in stone scar where you're able to keep pumping its attack and then obviously fate gain a shadow influence so c plus moving right along we have malaise malaise is a fastball at common for two and a shadow this is the target player of your choice discards the top six cards of their deck so i will say that there is a mill deck popping up in this format and there are cards that care about how many cards are in either your void or your opponent. So Malaise on the surface is typically a card we don't play in limited, but in this format, it might actually be good. So I will put it at a C minus. The card in of itself doesn't do anything, but it synergizes quite well with many of the other cards, including Baneful or Befile that we'll talk about here in a moment. So sure, Malaise, you get a C minus, but only in this format. It's probably still even a D. But like I said, there's plenty of cards that care about uh, voids. So I think it is probably somewhere about a C minus range. I could eat my words, but I think that's correct only in this format. Next up, we have Reconnaissance. Reconnaissance, yep. It is a slow spell at common for two and a shadow. And it says, give one of your units plus two attack and unblockable this turn. Okay, it helps facilitate mastery right off the bat. But if you decimate when it hits the enemy player this turn draw the top card of their deck so you can decimate to essentially play pilfer if it hits so it's good I, I like this card i think it does some work i think it is a solid c yeah i think it's a c i've seen it trigger mastery a lot i've seen the draw card be relevant i've seen it uh, allow you a way to push through damage and finish the game so i think reconnaissance is a c uh, once again, it runs into that stereotypical thing with combat tricks. Uh, or granted, it's not a combat trick, but unit buffs where you need to have units that are worth putting it in. If you're behind, this card isn't that good because obviously you're going to want to be blocking with your units and not attacking. But decimating an extra power to draw your card seems good. And uh, yeah, 
like I said, it's, I've seen it used a lot in the form of activating either with Berserk units. So you're drawing two cards, which then is fantastic. You're paying six and a maximum power to, or two and a maximum power to deal upwards of like six damage and draw two cards is absolutely great. So yeah, reconnaissance C minus. Smoke Dancer, this is a cultist at uncommon at two two, and it costs two and a shadow. So two two for two, fine. And Dragon Ally, play or uh, get it gets a plus two plus two, becoming a four four. So yeah, I think this card is fine. Solid C all around. Um, it being a four four, it, it seems good. That's two two becoming a four four is always nice, especially earlier in the game. But if not, like you're still just playing a two two for two, which is one hundred percent serviceable. And later in the game, when you already have a dragon in play, has a higher chance of just coming in as a four four, which is once again typically good in most cases. Uh, so yeah, I like Smoke Dancer. I think it is a solid C. Unkindness. Here we go. Here's one of our curse slash rewards. I like this card a lot as well. Hearing a lot of chitter chatter or chatter. Wait, flap. Uh, I was trying to think of the word that like birds chirp, a lot of chirping about it. Yeah, pun really bad. My bad. Unkindness. It is a cursed relic at uncommon for two shadow. At the end of the cursed player's turn, if they didn't play a unit, sacrifice unkindness to play three one one ravens with flying. Yeah, this card's good. You're essentially best case scenario dropping on two they don't play a two or a three and then you get three three worth of flying stats for two which is definitely an upgrade for sure it is across three bodies which would essentially tell you it's probably better especially since they're evasive so you can leave one behind and attack with two and it combos with another curse we'll talk about in a moment um, they all carry weapons well yeah this card seems good heaven forbid you should get two of them off and then you have six one one flying ravens yeah this card is really solid i like having it i think you're 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 gonna want to have it in any shadow deck regardless of whether your curses you have curse synergy or not so yep unkindness you get a c plus next up we have calamity oracle here is one of the synergy cards for the um the mill deck this is a one three elf shaman at uncommon for three and a primal so you're paying three for a one three eh, or shadow i'm sorry shadow i apologize for three and a shadow so one three for three is okay stats not great but not necessarily horrible either let's see what the text says when you play a curse the enemy player discards the top five cards of their deck believe it or not five is huge three is 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 negligible but five man you activate this thing twice that's already 10 cards from your opponent like that's a lot that's that's well over 10 percent of their deck in just two curses so this card does have some good payoffs that being said it is once again a build around so i would probably just give it a plain old c because i feel like if you have a lot of curses it bumps up to like a c my or c plus and it's an alternate wing con on its own it's probably closer to a c minus so i'll meet you in the middle and give calamity oracle a c moving right along we're at makar's blood wolf this is a two three wolf at common for three and a shadow so obviously there you go that's this baseline stats for three that we've seen three three for three two three for three are about the same roughly i mean obviously they don't tussle the same but it has a keyword it has lifesteal so that's relevant right and it also has mastery six so off the cuff vanilla it needs to block or deal damage or some or attack or etc three times to get a plus two plus two thus becoming a four five lifesteal it's really good I, I think this card fits curves in a lot of places you're super happy to play it the lifesteal sometimes makes it a little relevant as well late in the game it carries uh, weapons from exalted and stuff like that quite well so jackknife's jack's knife is in the format so that combos with this because because the lifesteal you actually take no damage so yeah this card is good i like my car's blood wolf at a c sunset priest here's the card i was talking about this is a three three elf cultist at common for three and a shadow so three three for three seems fine it has a summon ability each player so both of you discards the top three cards of their deck so you lose three card or mill three cards and they mill three cards so hopefully you would want this to synergize with your deck you have things like immortalize or be, uh, be follow that we're going to talk about in a moment where it cares about how many cards are in their void as well as yours 
but that's not always the case sometimes you do mill out your own good stuff that is a price to be had that being said i think this card is fine and serviceable uh, the big boy side of me does tell me that pulling cards in your void typically is a good thing as well because you get to see more of your deck and if you're in shadow you typically have the immortalized to get it back so that is something to think about so yeah sunset priest you get a C. A C is fine. I think I like C, and then obviously it adds to synergies of your opponent's cards being in their void. Next up, we have Torture. Torture is a slow curse at, or a curse, I guess there is no fast curse, a curse at common for three and a shadow. And pretty straightforward, the curse unit gets minus four, minus one. This card is actually overperformed for me. The minus one you would think doesn't kill a lot of things, but a lot of times just playing the minus four will shut down a lot of attackers. This card it does really well, even against bigger units where it won't kill. Let's say, for example, once again, we're going into the uh, Grodov's Favor, right? The 6-5. You play this on it, now that 6-5 is a 2-4, which is extremely manageable. So yeah, Torture is really good. I like Torture. I think Torture is a B-. minus. It's not amazing, but it's a better removal than you think. And it kills most flyers one way or the other. Either they can't attack or it straight up kills them. So Torture, you are a B-. minus. Vile Collaborators next on our list. This is a 2-2 Cultist at Uncommon for 3 and a Shadow. Vile Collaborator says your dragons have plus one, plus one, and lifesteal. So this is actually a way better than it seems. You are going down onto that, it's getting two, two for three, which we're not excited about. But if you have mm, four plus dragons, I think Vile Collaborator gets a lot better because of the fact that whatever tempo loss or life you lose with playing a two, two on three, you will get it back with your dragons already not being small units. They get bigger with the plus one, plus one, but more importantly, they get lifesteal on evasive units. As far as I know, all dragons are flying. So you're getting lifesteal on an evasive unit. So that is huge and a great way to stabilize the board. So I like Vile Collaborator. I think it's quite good. So same thing, C minus. If you don't have a lot of dragons, C plus if you do have dragons. So I think I'll lean it towards a C plus. Vile Collaborator, you are a C plus, my friend. <laughs> Moving right along to Blood of Makar. Blood of Makar is a cursed relic at uncommon for four and a shadow. This card says when one of your units hits the cursed player, it deals plus or it gets plus two attack of note i don't know if it's a glitch or not but it happened and it stood out to me where i was able to like flash grenade an opponent's unit and so they had zero attack but they were still attacking so they hit me and it triggered the, the blood of makar so once again i'm not 100 percent sure if that is as uh, i didn't put a bug on it i, I think we just as a chat it was live on stream i think chat just decided like it still quote unquote hit you just didn't do any damage i don't know if that worked correctly but it does trigger so that is of note another thing is is that any abilities that deal damage to you will trigger this so things like razor quill when you twist it and deals one damage to the opponent and you gain one life it actually will trigger the blood of makar giving it not only the plus one minus one from the twist but also the plus two attack so blood of makar is great i like this card a lot reason being is it upgrades all your units right if you have some some flyers this thing just skyrockets the damage your flyers do because they continue to get in there and they can you know being upgraded plus two plus two plus two to a point where they're going to trade up on cards if your opponent didn't answer them a good example is the three crows from a kindness if you play on kindness then play one of a car and attack right and let's say you have the three crows right then all of a sudden you go from three one ones that have flying to three three twos or three ones that have flying which is huge so i think this card is really powerful obviously it is a do nothing enchant or curse when you do play it so there is that but i think it also has the potential of running out running over or running away with the game so and it forces your opponent to make more aggressive blocks because of the fact that they don't want your units becoming larger and harder to block so i like this blood of makar a lot i'm giving blood of makar a c plus dread hellkite this card is another one that seems to be deceptively good and un overperforms. is it is a four three flying deadly nightmare dragon at uncommon for four shadow shadow and it says summon play cowardice on an enemy unit which pretty much means the unit cannot block so it takes an air oh, probably a flyer out of the equation so it can't block 
Or, you know, if you're really getting aggressive and slamming in on the ground, you can get their biggest blocker out of the way. So that is really good. And it is dealing four damage in the air for four, so that's solid. Of note though, Dread Hellkite can't block, which you typically don't want your flyers to block, but sometimes that does come into play, especially when it has deadly, you want it to block and it can't. That's something to remember. That being said, I am gonna put Dread Hell Kite at a C because or C plus, I'm sorry, because it does win you the game in short order, but the fact that it can't block means it's pretty horrible when you're behind. And I typically like cards to do something when you're behind. So it's just getting a C plus. Next up, we have another piece, and this one I'm gonna tell you right now is just a solid straight all around B. This is Fell Ritual. This is a slow spell at uncommon for four shadow shadow. And it reads, kill a unit. That's it, period. Doesn't matter if it's a 1-1, one, one, a 10-10, ten, ten, flying, doesn't matter. Pay for, kill a unit, which is awesome and so rare in this format. So, Bell Ritual, you are a solid B, but there is more text. So we're just getting upside here. Create a 5-5 five, five, Nihil, 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 Draconis with flying and lifesteal and put it into your void. That's right, you're not getting a free dragon, but you somewhat are because actually Nihil Draconis only cost th four to play. So you're getting a 5-5 five, five Flying Lifesteal Dragon for four, which is a huge deal. It is going to your void, but once again, remember we have Immortalize. So you, this shadow does have ways of getting it out of the void. So it is, sometimes it is just gonna be throw a dragon into your deck that's or into your void, that's fine, and kill unit. And then sometimes it's like, hey, Kill unit and you're gonna get a dragon eventually. So, Fell Ritual, you are awesome. You are a B, solid removal. Next up we have Marsh Dragon. This is a 3-1 Nightmare Dragon at common for five and a shadow as flying and then summon. You may sacrifice another unit to gain health equal to the number of units in your void and give Marsh Dragon that much health. So at base, worst case scenario, you. You have no units in your void. You play Marsh Dragon. You sack your 1-1 one, one, or 2-2. Two, two, <coughs> and then you will gain one life. And your Marsh Dragon becomes a 3-2 flyer. I've seen this card do some work. Especially once again with Self Mill. Or the later you draw it. Remember I said those cultists come into play. So later in the game you draw this. You play this. You sack your 1-1 one, one, or 2-2 two, two, or whatever is in play. You have four units in your void now. So this is now gonna become a three five flying dragon and you gain four life. So yeah, Marsh Dragon's good. I like it. I think it is a very solid C, maybe even a C plus. We'll see how often the, the sack outlets come in and the sack engines. But I do like it also combos really well with Exalted because you're able to trigger your exalted and slap it on the marsh dragon or slap it on another unit so i think that's solid so yeah actually i like marsh dragon as c plus we'll put marsh dragon as c plus it is five but i feel like the fact that it gets you you know can upgrade your units is quite effective and then obviously if either of you are milling each other and there's like six seven units on the board or in the void all of a sudden this thing gets absolutely huge so yeah i think i think marsh dragon is a good c plus and finally, our last shadow card is Bane Wolf. Big Papa Pump. This is 7 6 Dire Beast at common. I'm surprised it doesn't say Dire Beast Wolf. That's interesting. Anywho, it is at 7 cost and a shadow for a 7 6. So easily splashable, easily playable. Except for the 7. Like, obviously, like we talked about, it's going to be turn 9, 8, 9, 10. But it also has Mastery 7. Of note, it is equal with its attack, so it just has to block or attack once to gain unblockable. This thing can potentially end games extremely quickly. That is something to consider. Uh, oh, I completely missed one. I totally apologize, guys. I was wondering something just, I don't know why I missed this. I'll cover it in a second, but let's finish Baby Wolf. Actually, it works out that we waited to do it. This card is great. If you're able to stabilize, it will stabilize you because it's huge. And the fact that if it does block or hit once and all of a sudden now it's unblockable, this card is a huge threat and will make game close out games in short order. So the true last card, I don't know how I missed this one, is B Foul. B Foul is a slow spell at uncommon for four and a shadow, right? It's a sacrifice two units to play a seven six Bane Wolf. So obviously we just talked about and deal went over mastery seven becomes unblockable now there's some bonus text remember i said there's synergy there's void synergies right not just the, the fell ritual 
if there are 10 or more cards in the enemy void play an additional bane wolf so what this means is you are playing be foul you sacrifice two units hopefully downgraded units like your two twos and your three threes and things like that and you get a seven six so you upgraded two units for one you are down a card you're actually dead right you're down two cards actually because you paid be foul to get a seven six and you sack two units to do it but should it be later in the game or you milled your opponent some and they have twin or more now you are up some serious power maybe not a card because you still spend three cards for two but you definitely upgraded because now you have two seven six bane wolves on the board that could potentially be unblockable this card is absolutely backbreaking it changes the dynamics of the game so much by adding two huge threats this card is awesome i like it be foul you are a b minus i think it is awesome uh, the reason why i'm giving it a b minus though is because of the fact that you do have to have at least two units on the board to sack and sometimes that's not always beneficial but the power behind this card is what makes me want to put it give it a b uh, but yeah or b minus or yeah give it up in the b category but yeah b foul is awesome but all right guys that's gonna do it for shadow shadow seems super powerful super cool and synergy wise i like shadow quite a bit uh, but yeah, I'm super excited to play it. Hope you guys are too. All right, ladies and gentlemen, home stretch. We are almost there. Fire is our final faction for this set review. Really appreciate you guys tuning in thus far. First off, we have Edict of Shavka. This is the fire edict. It is a slow spell at uncommon for one and a fire. Edict of Shavka can't be negated or blocked by Aegis. Okay. Deal one damage to an enemy. All right, I, I dig it, I dig it. Deal one damage, we have already established that it kills quite a few things, and it costing one is fair enough. I don't think the Aegis or the negated part uh, really come into play in limited, but that's okay. And if it's primal or uh, justice, deal five damage to it instead. So, the primal one is fine. I think that's gonna kill most flyers that are on the board. The issue I have is on the justice side where in justice you kind of want this to maybe negate like a draw strength or something like that. And a lot of times I feel like five damage may not do it. It has a pretty good chance of negating a um, high alert, but I think that, that makes it a little slightly less like premium removal. So once again, edict, it's going to go as the C+. Plus. I do like it, but I don't think it's 100% unconditional. And of course, obviously, it's only hitting 2.5% of, or actually less than that. It's hitting 2, 2.5% two of the factions in the format, just giving it a half for those double faction cards. So, Edict of Shavka, you get a C+. Plus. Moving on, we have Breath of Voprex. This is a fast spell, a common for 2 red or two and fire breath of voprex deal five damage to an enemy unit unless the enemy player chooses to take five damage instead so i'm really glad they rewarded this because it really made everyone confused about it but a long story short they have to have a unit in play that is important they have to have a unit in play to play it then the opponent will get to choose whether the unit takes five or they take five themselves to the face the problem with the spell is, is that once again, like we said earlier, whenever you give your opponent the choice, they are going to pick the one that benefits them the most and you the least. Now, granted, Breath of Voprex, there is a small window of when their life total is low enough, they may not be able to take it to the face, and thus they will, they will have to remove a unit, but in many cases, it's not going to be your favorable. So I am actually quite low on Breath of Voprex, and thus Breath of Voprex, Honestly, yeah, D. Yeah, I'm not very high on it. I think even if you're the most aggressive deck, like you have to come out the gate swinging, your opponent has to have no kinds of blockers. Like, yeah, no, Vo Breath of Voprex, you get a D. Let's move on to Desperate Gambit. This is a fast spell at common for two and a fire. <clears throat> Give one of your units plus two plus one this turn. Okay, decent, decent. Decimate give an additional one of your units plus two plus one this turn so if you decimate you're able to give two different units 
plus one plus or plus two plus one, thus adding four power to the board for two and a decimate. This is typically going to be the last spell you cast. I think it's a fine combat trick. Um, the plus one health does help it trade up a little bit. That being said, it isn't a crazy high combat trick, so I'm gonna put about a C minus. I think Desperate Gambit gets a C minus. Next up, we have Shavka's Evangel, which is the Fire Evangel. This is the 2 2 owning Cleric at Common for two Fire Fire. It has Berserk, which I think is great in this format and fate gain a fire influence yep we've already talked enough about these guys this one gets a c plus like the other ones i think it's one of my favorite ones out of the two or out of the five just because the berserk comes into play soul's fury it is a slow spell at common for two and a fire sacrifice a unit to deal four damage to an enemy it could go to the face or it could go to another unit i think it's okay you probably want one of these in your deck it's either the last spell you're going to play to kill your opponent or it helps you remove an annoying flyer or something once again upgrading you are two for wanting yourself to do this but sometimes there are some sack synergies or you have a one or two drop that's just sitting around and doing anything and this is a way to somewhat upgrade it but i'm not super high on it um probably d plus maybe is yeah probably d plus a c minus it's gonna be the last card you include in your deck i'm not super high on it because once again you're two throwing yourself so i'm okay putting it at d minus or d plus sorry teething whelp is our next one this is a 2-2 two -two nightmare dragon at uncommon for two and a red mastery two so as soon as it hits it gains flying that's nice if you're on the play and drop it on two then chances are if they don't have a two drop you're able to get in there and make it flying then mastery six plus three plus three this thing becomes a five five flyer for two that is awesome this card is really good i like this card quite a bit that being said though there is a finite window of where it can get in damage you have to give it a pump or evasion or something because the two two does die fairly quickly and easily or it gets trumped very easily so i'm not super high on teething whelp i have seen it run away with the game and i've seen it come down and do absolutely nothing so teething whelp you are probably a c plus i'm okay with yeah c plus i'm fine with i think it's definitely in the c category but it is something to consider next up we have warbrush oni this is a two one oni at common for two and a red and summon each unit and weapon in your hand gets a plus one attack i like this card this card is good too uh Hey, having the one toughness, obviously we've already explained that it dies to a lot of things and trades all the time. But the fact that it does give you a slight upgrade on your more aggressive decks, especially if you are able to play this on turn two, and that it buffs your weapons, is kind of nice. I like Warbushoni, I'll give him a C. I think it is a great addition for the meat and potatoes of your deck. All right, this one's a little interesting one, Dragon Forge. This is a fast spell at uncommon for three and fire. Draw a dragon or weapon of your choice from your deck and reduce its cost by one. This card seems good to me. Uh, tutor effects are always good. You are drawing it. I do like the fact that it is fast speed, which means you are able to essentially play it at the end of your opponent's turn when you have the most amount of information and they have the least amount of time to react to it. I think that does go up in value. It obviously goes up in value as well if you have some kind of rare weapon or dragon that can potentially win you a game, a bomb. And the minus one to cost is definitely not something to gawk at, especially if you're going to get like a seven cost dragon or six cost dragon being able to play a turn early is huge so yeah i like dragon forge that being said though it still is a tutor effect so and it's not absolutely broken you need to have a dragon or a weapon worth looking for so yeah dragon forge you're a c i think it's fine at c of note also you know it kind of effectively can act as two of whatever your your rare is you know if it's a dragon because you if you draw either one you're drawing the dragon so something to consider Next up we have Funeral Pyre. This is fast spell at uncommon for three and a fire. Deal two damage to an enemy, period. Can go face, can go unit, and it's fast speed. I like it. I'm okay. Obviously it is a little under par or way under par from Conflagrate, right? Because it is one more and one less damage, but it's still a decent spell in, in a pinch if you need to remove something, eat up a combat trick, or get a blocker or flyer out of the way. But there is more. If you decimate deal two damage to an additional enemy so note this does not stack it does not become four damage to one enemy you still have to spread it across two units but 
I mean, that's not bad. Now all of a sudden you're paying three and a power to deal four damage across two bodies, which seems quite relevant. That allows your smaller guys to trade up. It gets two blockers out of the way. There's a lot of things this, this card does. It's pretty decent diversity. So I like it. I'm going to put Funeral Prior at a B minus just because removal is so rare and even if this is limited removal it's still fairly clean and easy to cast and i mean you can also go two to get a blocker out of the way and two to the face so i like it i'm gonna put funeral prior at a b next up we have gaudy showman this is a 4-1 oni rogue at common for three and a fire and it says summon exhaust an enemy unit this is a super aggressive card um the deck it has obviously some oni synergies no rogue synergies the fact that it's a 4-1 means it's vulnerable to so much removal and it pretty much is never going to attack. It's going to do its effect and unless the board is clear or you have a combat trick, it's just going to stay back on defense, hopefully being able to take out a unit or trade up for like a 4 or 5 drop unit with its 4 attack. It's right. It's not flashy. It serves a purpose. I think I'll give it just a standard C just because it does its thing in the decks that want it. Though I do think it's not as great as you would you know as one would hope all right razor wild tote mite is next this is a one one totemite at common for three and a fire it has exalted and quick draw so obviously we are seeing the value of exalted as they are extremely low statted units a one one for three is definitely not something you're happy about even if it does have quick draw in most cases it just like i said says unblockable because your opponent is just gonna let you keep swinging with it until you get its power a little bit higher but the other note, you know, giving a large unit quick draw or even a decent sized flyer means it's going to survive a lot longer and could pose a threat to your opponent. So I think this card is good as well. I'm going to give Razorwire Tote Might AC. This card I have no idea just yet. So Cinder Ma Tota is a Tote Might at common at 0 4. And it costs 4 and a red. And what it says is, your dragons and treasure troves cost one less. Okay, like, probably need about four plus dragons to make this feel like it's worth it. Like, if it's playing two, like, if you have three dragons in your deck, chances are you're going to see two of them, one to two of them during a game. So if this saves you two power, I don't really feel like it's worth putting a four cost 0 4 in your deck. But there is a, some additional text. In Tomb, create and draw a 4-4 Cinder Dragon with flying. Now, of note, it does create it and draw it. Uh, let me just double check something real quick. So the only thing I'm not 100% sure on, which is whether, and I do apologize about that, is whether it, the Cinder Dragon it creates will have the influence requirements or not. Because then obviously that makes that changes things a lot. Reason being is Cinder Dragon is a Stone Scar or Shadow and Primal or Shadow and Fire required dragon, influence requiring dragon. So if you aren't playing Shadow and it requires you to play Shadow, then you pretty much didn't draw anything. So that is something to consider. Like I said, I have to find out. I have not seen this die in game yet to verify that. So I do apologize for that, guys but let's just say it doesn't for right now or it does require them have the requirements then this card obviously is only for if you're able to play it uh, or have shadow in your deck at all and that would probably put it close to d and honestly yeah I, I think it is a i don't know like i feel like there's some value to it because you are getting a dragon uh, let's just go with c minus right now i think i'm gonna go for c minus because i'm really not sure uh, if you're guaranteed the dragon then this goes up in value because an 04 is going to do some serious blocking for you and then when they finally get rid of it because they're tired of it blocking everything then you're gonna get a 4-4 dragon that's flying out of it so that seems pretty good as well and it helps bridge you into the late game where you have the power to cast it yeah let's go c minus for right now for cinder Maul until i can confirm on whether you need the shadow influence for the dragon or not if you don't then it probably bumps up closer to a c plus but all right, that's Cinder Ma Tota. Moving right along, we have Relentless Combatant. This is a 2 3 warrior at common for 4 red red. It has Berserk and it has Mastery 8. Get a plus 2 plus 2. So eventually, when this thing does 8 damage, it will become a 4 5 on its own. It does have Berserk though. 
I'm not thrilled at the fact that you are paying an additional power for a 2-3 to have Berserk, but this card does see some work with various pump spells as well as evasive things like the Griffin, they give it flying for a turn, stuff like that. And then obviously if you're able to give it double damage, this thing can just do immense amounts which I have done, it's absolutely amazing. There is a clip on YouTube about it for the shameless plug. It's a lot of fun. I end up doing 32 damage, I believe, with this guy. So it's awesome. But yeah, just something to consider. Uh, I think this card's fine. I think it's a C. Straight up, just plain simple C. Next up, we have Warhorn. It's a plus two, plus two common weapon for four and a fire. When the wielder hits the enemy player, create and draw a 2-2 two -two Oni Grunt. Yeah, this card's great. This card is very good. If you're able to slap it on a flyer or a big enough unit where you can just keep getting in there and have an endless army of tutus, it's giving you a card advantage as well as dealing damage to your opponent. Yeah, I like this card a lot. That being said, paying four for a plus two, plus two. Typically, uh, obviously on turn four when you play it, if that's a perfect world and you can get in there, you will get a tutu, but you will not be able to follow it up till later and later turns. Then when you start getting in there, you put it on a flyer, you know what I mean? It hits them you get the two two you're immediately able to play it to block and stuff like that then this card tends to run around run away with the game it is very much a snowball a snow volley card it's pretty bad when you're behind uh it's okay to bad at parody and then you know development's good and then obviously when you're ahead it's awesome so warren probably just a decent c i think it's just an even c because you do have to have a unit that's relevant on the board for this thing to be effective or have a combat trick to help push through damage but I do like it. I think Warhorn is better than it seems. Next up, we have Burning Claw. This is a 6 of 5 Oni at Uncommon for 5 Fire Fire. Artwork seems cool. When one of your other Oni dies, draw each weapon it was wielding from your void. So this kind of sounds like another sharp axe sharpener. So any, you know, when, as long as it's Oni, that's the thing though, no, no, it does have to be an Oni. It's not any unit. So things like the Relentless Combatant that's just a warrior or any tote mites that are carrying weapons will not trigger this. But if an Oni is carrying a weapon and that Oni dies, you get to draw all those weapons back into your hand. It does not make a copy of it like Axe Sharpener. It simply draws that weapon. So it comes out of your void and goes back in your hand and you can play it again. And of course it says other onis so burning claw you can equip burning claw or attach weapons to them and it won't make a difference so two things to think about uh that being said also just the body is great a six five for five we already liked the six fives for six just having silence on it so six five for five is really good too especially in fire that's already an aggressive color so i like a burning claw a lot i think it's a very strong card so i'm gonna put it at ac plus i think burning claw is a great finisher for red decks all right almost done guys five cards left we have next dramatic exit this is the five five and a red uncommon slow spell that reads give one of your units plus four attack and exalted permanently sacrifice it at the end of turn so yeah if you're in skycrag or, or time or praxis and you have some way of bouncing your unit awesome it gets that stuff permanently but if you don't that is okay as well because even when you sacrifice it at the end of turn, it will have exalted. So when the when the weapon or the unit dies, all its stats and special abilities plus the floor attack that a dramatic exit gave it will play will transform into a weapon that you can immediately equip on one of your other units. This is a great way to push through damage, a great way to sack your high static guys or things that aren't making a difference. Like for example, if you have a 1-1 flyer that is being stonewalled by all your opponents 2-2 two, two, and 2-3 two, flyers you can easily put dramatic exit in it and swing one they will they will have to decide on whether they want to block or not and regardless of whether they do or not the unit is going to die and then you'll be able to give one of your big guys that's on the ground one of your beaters flying to be able to continue to push through damage so dramatic exit is quite good it is costing you a card to do it but the fact that it's giving the unit exalted so you're only losing one card to do this is quite good and of course when you're able to combo it off with uh, pump spells and things like that it ends up being quite good and just to mention again there is a little wombo combo of dramatic exit and emerged units so when a unit comes out of shifted and you play this on it while it's emerged it has unblockable yes unblockable will be transferred over to your other unit so that is something to consider i like dramatic exit quite a bit i'm putting it at a hmm 
Let's go with B plus or B minus. I'm sorry, B minus. I apologize. I think I'm going to put Dramatic Exit at B minus because it actually is really great at breaking board stalls as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's enough to kind of push it into the B range for me. It is five. You don't want a ton of these in your deck, but uh, it's obviously horrible when you're behind, but and not good when development. But everywhere else, both at parity and uh, when you you don't even need it when you're actually shoot. Now I talk about it. All right, fine. Dramatic X is actually a C plus. It's a C plus. We'll lock that in. You you sold me on it, Caesar. It is a dramatic exit. Is a C plus. Because, yeah, I can see drawing this on an empty board or just units that don't do anything. You're like, yeah, that's kind of, yeah. Ooh. Actually, shoot, I talked to myself even lower to it. <laughs> Man, that's crazy. This card seems so good, but at the same time, there are so many times where it does nothing. Interesting. Let me know in the comments below what you guys think about Dramatic Exit. I do think this card is powerful, but that is true. If you're behind, it does Stone Cold nothing. And then if you don't have, like, a good unit, it just kind of sits your hand for a while. Hmm. Is it really a C? No, it has to be a C plus. I yeah, I know. I think it's C plus. This is this this helps you win a lot of games, so it has to be more powerful than that. All right, next up we have Flame Keeper. Flame Keeper is a four two Oni at Uncommon for five red red or fire fire. It has exalted. It has overwhelm. So a four two overwhelm is not too bad. Exalted is nice. But it also has you have overwhelm. And by you, it means you, the player. So your weapons and your spells have overwhelm. So imagine an obliterate uh, tacked on text, tacked on to all your spells and weapons. So when you hit a unit or deal damage, any excess damage that uh, is beyond what would kill the unit gets rolled over to the player's face. Yeah, this card is good. I like it. I like her a lot. I think Flame Keeper does some work because a 4-2 typically will, and granted it being a 5 means it, it you're not necessarily trading up, but it will trade effectively, and then giving another unit plus 4, plus 2 minimum and Overwhelm is fantastic. You definitely like to see Overwhelm on units that have a lot of attack. So I like Flame Keeper. I think it is a C+. Plus. Plenty of C pluses in Fire, man. Fire's got some good synergies here. All right, we have Living Mountain at Common. It is a giant. It's a 4-4. Four, four. And it costs five and a red. So four, 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 five, eh, not too excited about, but all right, what's the summon effect? Summon, give one of your other units plus two, plus two, and overwhelm this turn. Okay, so it kind of helps push your last bits of mastery off of your smaller units. That's exactly what it does. Plus two, plus two on turn five to another unit is quite effective and could help you push in the damage you need. Granted, it has to give it to another unit. So if for one, some random reason, you are able to give Living Monument Mountain uh, charge it will not work on itself but yeah I, I think it's okay it's a c it's a solid c i think you're fine playing it you're not super excited about the stats but four four is somewhat relevant and you're paying so you're paying one to give a plus two you're giving pummel somewhat you're dang maneuver to another unit for the turn so i think it's fine next up we have slayer's edge this is a plus five plus two relic weapon at uncommon for five and a fire summon create and draw a treasure trove for each different name amongst your dragons i think a lot of times this is just gonna be a five cost kill spell in most cases um occasionally you what would you, you're gonna draw probably a treasure trove off of it which i think is still fine you're replacing itself somewhat so i think slayer's dragon is fine it having two armor means it can trade up but most of the time it's just gonna be even you're very rarely going to get a two for one out of it unless you're counting the treasure trove. So then it might be a two for two for one in your favor. Well, yeah, two for one. Uh, if not, it's just going to be a one for one, which in many cases is fine. Just being able to remove a unit with five health or less sometimes is quite relevant, like a good sized flyer, or another dragon, or a decent beater like the Living Mountain that we just talked about. So yeah, Slayer's Edge, you get a C. I think it is fine. It is somewhat conditional removal and still costs five. And lastly, here we go. We have Skyfire Hellkite. This is a 7 4 Nightmare Dragon at Uncommon. It costs seven Fire Fire. It has flying and summon. Each one of your units deals one damage to the enemy player. So we've seen this before on other units, but this one's different in the fact that A, this one has evasion, and B, 
it is a seven drop so chances are by the time you play this right away you are going to be able to do somewhere between three to eight damage with this thing and yes i've seen this thing do eight and when you do like somewhere above four to like seven damage to your opponent and then they are staring down at a seven four flyer they are in serious trouble they're very much in chump block mode or scrambling to try to do uh, some work this thing is a great finisher it's great at breaking parodies obviously it's good when you're ahead if you even make it that far in a red deck to seven power um, and it can break a board stall by obviously doing enough damage to your opponent to change uh, things up uh, the four health makes a little bit of a liability obviously it it the it doesn't necessarily trade double block or um require double block to take it out in some cases but the seven attack does mean it will trade with most things that do try to block it so that's pretty solid as well and of course if they have no way of stopping it it ends the game in short order so i like skyfire dragon i think it's a solid pickup and a solid um game ender so i like it that being said it is still seven so i'll probably put it about uh i'll put it c c plus I, I think it's fine as c plus i think this really does even if it just stays there on defense still squeaking a bunch of damage is relevant especially in fire deck so i like it i'll give skyfire dragon or skyfire correction skyfire hellkite a c plus but that's it guys that is going to do it fire looks good i like it a lot of aggressive cards there's some play in there um some of the cards are definitely skill test but it looks very very aggressive like red there is no doubt about it red wants to get you dead fast but that is it guys we made it we made it through all of them you could totally stop here if you want and skip the rest of it and just go about your day we did it but if not thank you guys so so much for tuning in i hope you did enjoy that all right and of course with that leads us to go into our what's the play all right so here's what we got guys we have our opponent is at 23 life we are at 12 life our opponent is at one of six power and they are combray we are at eight of eight power and we are combray as well our opponent has two cards in hand we have two cards in hand in the form of omnivorous vorlunk the three cost time time 3-1 that has killer and a draw strength and we have a high alert off the top of our library so we can warp in a high alert our opponent on the board has a 6-6 six, six, uh kieran the 2-2 two, two, that uh mastery or whatever long story short it's a 6-6 six, six. they have a 4-6 recruiter the they have a shifted Oh, that's why that's why it's a six six because they have a shifted war wagon with two ticks that's a four four and it's shifted obviously on the kirin and then they have the one one flying arcanum elite we have a two three rotor cycle flying a two three silenced um toward test pilot and a five five silenced locust hatcher so the test pilot and locust hatcher were silenced by mute so my question to you is what's the play a couple options we have is we can play the vorlunk and then play the hyler off the top of our deck to couple of options we have is to play the vorlunk and then either play the high alert or the draw strength on it to take out one of their units to keep our vorlunk alive and obviously clear the board <clears throat> we can do nothing we can attack etc i mean there's a ton of things you can do we can attack with everything as well um because we have the high alert to take back a blocker or activate or refresh a blocker ready there we go i'm sorry ready a blocker we can high alert we can take out several things so what i ended up doing here is i ended up attacking with the rotor cycle because it wasn't going to be blocking and we wanted to start getting in damage once again our opponent's at 23 we are at 12 so we need to start racing and having two combat tricks at the top of our deck or access in one turn made me feel like we were in a really good spot to kind of 
play into whatever tricks they had because we could high alert first and then based on whatever happened after the high alert use the draw strength to finish them off we have plenty of power so we want to draw strength now our opponent has more units than we do to really capitalize on its ability and kind of two for oneing ourselves with the vorlunk doesn't necessarily or at least one for one doesn't seem very great we're playing two cards that i just feel like are better used trying to get a combat trick out of their hand and so that's what ended up happening so our opponent let me fast forward a little bit so we did exactly as i said we attacked with just the rotor cycle they went ahead and took the damage and then passed it back to us or we sent it back and what they end up doing is playing a relentless headshot and freezing our locust hatcher they then proceeded to attack with the team i believe yes they proceeded to attack with the team so it played out much like we said went ahead and played the high alert off the top of our deck on the locust hatcher breaking the stun and making an 88 locust hatcher and then draw strength the toward test pilot thus allowing us to block both the 66 Kieran and the 46 recruiter killing both their units leaving both of ours alive and then the following turn we were able to then play our vorlunk killing their 3-1 dead shot to swing in for a ton of damage as well as not having to worry about lifesteal changing the race so that is our what's the play of the week ladies and gentlemen hope you enjoyed it hope it was a little easier to follow on and bringing up the tail end of our show is our constructed corner this week death was not able to have a deck quite ready for you guys because i do we do want the deck to have some testing behind it and make sure we get you the most optimal builds we're not just throwing any jank at you should you decide to craft things so you will have a spicy brew finalized for you guys next week so this week i am going to give you the two things i've been playing first off i was exploring a little bit of charge mono red or mono red charge i should say and i gotta say it's pretty good i end up having two of the listener the fire listener which is the four cost triple fire for one charge and when it comes into play it has inspire fire so you get to immediately pick between a fire weapon a f or attachment a fire unit and a fire spell and let me tell you this this deck is more or less straightforward obviously once again running coin and tactic and then fire sigils all the way up and i have top end is four eclipse dragons two grodovs i'm running uh, zuberi and actually i think zuberi is quite good because it is a removal magnet but also since i have so many charge units it uh is is just, just absolutely backbreaking there there's one of the highlights on youtube where literally i just top decked the uh, listener and i had the brigand in play already with double damage and it just oh my god it was so much damage off the top so i do think that deck is fun i i do have a positive win record with it I'm still finalizing the pieces you know plugging some things in trying to turn to get locked it in for you guys but overall mono red charge is still very much viable getting underneath a lot of strategies the but the other deck that i actually got i gotta give credit to that is the one that got me from d3 all the way to masters this week in less than two days is this praxis ramp deck by a ghostly toaster from team not tavrod he worked with his teammates on it marvin the imp and valen to put this together and i gotta say the deck has played ex performed extremely well for me and is a lot of fun i will throw the disclaimer out it is extremely expensive to craft so if you haven't played the game for a while i may not recommend this unless you are a timmy and just love playing big dumb powerful units that's where i enjoy part of the game so let me break down the deck list for you guys uh hold on let me adjust a little bit so the youtube guys can see it there we go uh, i wasn't quite on the screen correctly but so first off we have three flame blasts we have one in, four initiated the sands, four seek power, four torch, four trailmaker, four Aurelian merchants, four Ramba Arena showman, which is a new card, four Tokos Waystone Harvester, four Sandstorm Titan, four Yushkov, the Usurper, four World Bear Behemoth, four Heart of the Volts, three Karyos Grand Champions, the new card. 2 Fire Sigil, 5 Time Sigil, 4 Crest of Impulse, 3 Granite Waystone, 3 Praxis Banner, 
four praxis insignia, and four seat of impulse. The market has one disassociate, one xenon initiation, one praxis marcanum, one karyos grand champion, and one praxis banner. So I, they do a really great job of the write-up on Eternal Warcry. So you guys should definitely check that out. I'll put the links in the show notes if you are watching this on YouTube. Uh, and yeah, it's it's quite powerful. I do enjoy this. Uh, I'll put it on the SoundCloud one as well. It'll be in the show notes. But it's a really fun deck to play. And it really is true. If you notice, it's not running a lot of removal. But the problem is, is that it's so taxing that the units themselves are removal. You just keep putting haymakers what it does is kind of negate the mid part of the game and just skips goes straight from ramping as much as you can in the early game to dropping your hearts of the vault and karyos grand champions that's why there's one in the market to end up making it more consistent and to fight against uh, royal decree and things like that it's running yushkov because believe it or not his ability to let me go ahead and read him real quick yushkov is a four four for four triple fire when the enemy player plays a unit exhaust it so it's a, a urn of burning embers on a stick and then ultimate at the start of your turn you get plus one power this turn plus an additional power for each exhausted enemy unit so at the very least it ramps you one you get uh let's say your opponent is attacking you all those things or if they play a unit then it's going to ramp you additional power for the turn and let me tell you there have been several times where i've ramped from like four or five to nine if, especially if my opponent's an aggressive deck and they don't realize what yushkov can do they'll swing into it or they'll try to get over if they have a bunch of flyers and then all of a sudden i'm getting eight to nine power i can ramp out heart of the vault a turn early or i could play a world breaker be bear behemoth and something else two titans um or just ramp out karyos like this deck is a ton of fun and there's nothing better than like drawing like six cards off of Karos and then uh, next turn like Karos and then next turn like following just burning them in the face with the heart of the vault doing eight to their face and then a titan doing another five like this deck is so much fun ramba is a great inclusion i believe it took the spot of zo in the previous format and the it ramps you as well because when R ramba is a four four for three fire fire time time when Rumba hits the enemy player, reduce the cost of each card in your hand by one. So if it hits the enemy player and they're not chump blocking, you're you're getting ramp. Your 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 bear your heart of the vault is five. Your world bear behemoth is four. Your Karos is eight. Kairos. So and then later on in the game, when you top deck him, pay seven to play the top card of your deck. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've paid seven to warp in a. Uh, a uh karos uh two times so far i've done it where karos off the top to go in and just explode as well as like a yushkov or a world bear behemoth obviously it's cheaper with the heart of the vault but yeah this deck is a ton of fun to play the few times i have lost has actually been my own deck losing to me or a deck that just kind of plays out really well i have lost let me see uh i believe i didn't write down my record but it was because I like it once again it was over uh, it was across two days but I did not get more than 10 win or 10 losses I know that for a fact because I think I lost two games the first day and like four games the second day and took me all the way from D the beginning of D3 all the way to Masters and I lost against a Stone Scar deck only because of the fact that they were able to play uh, they were running uh sight and chunk chunks and so they were able to stun my guys enough to keep getting damage through and they used they were smart they used their removal to take out my ramp so i was only able to play one unit a turn uh, another deck was a uh, the argent port deck is a little rough for this deck if their removal lines up correctly i if they are able to delay the game with a good uh like a good harsh rule and i can't follow up with anything typically in this deck when you go up against a deck with harsh rule all you have to do is play like somewhere about five to seven power on the board and swing and they're forced to harsh rule and then you're able to follow it up with another five to seven power and it's hard for them to recover or obviously landing a karyos with a full hand there are ways to beat those decks but like i said if they lined up with a really solid harsh rule and i drew poorly 
or I only saw one part of my one side of my deck, which honestly doesn't happen all that often. I was surprised when this deck has no mid range or mi mid game. You'd think it would be either or a lot more, but it actually plays out quite well. And like I said, I think having some stuff in the market that's quite relevant is good. Also, if you anticipate a harsh roll and you have the ability to, you can grab disassociate and typically setting them back two turns on it is more than enough to clear the board. But yeah, this deck is a ton of fun. I enjoy it quite a bit. So if you are interested in swinging with giant monsters, try this Praxis deck out. Praxis Ramp, once again, by a ghostly toaster. I enjoyed it quite a bit. I think it's quite efficient. And then if not, you want things lower to the ground and cheaper. Once again, give uh, the mono red charge. I do think it has to be charge. I think that is the biggest thing because so many decks are running Harsh Rule and uh, Hailstorm where here in the way I run that mono red deck is I'll drop four or five power on the board, swing in that, let that eat the Hailstorm and then immediately follow up with more damage because they all have charge. Uh, the reason being is, like I said, I'm running things like four Sensari Brigands, four Initiates, four uh, uh, Eclipse Dragons, and two Godas. So all that really leads into pounding, like some serious ground pounding. Uh, it helps you sneak in a ton of damage, and heaven forbid, a Zuberi should stick. If a Zuberi should stick, like the game is almost over because you're just doing so much damage. So. But yeah, guys, that's it for the Constructed Corner, which means that's it for our show. Thank you guys so, so much for bearing with me on this super long set of reviews, but I do enjoy doing them. I hope you guys are getting something out of it. Let me know in the comments below if you really like to see these, if they're just too grueling, and or if you're getting some, something out of it. I really do appreciate it. Next week, we will be doing the rare and legendary set review. So once again, going down card by card, letting you know my e A to F slash build around grades to it. But until then, I hope you guys are enjoying the draft format. I know I am. You can catch me as always on Twitter or YouTube at EJ the podcast as the eternal journey in the surf bar, search bar. It should come up. You can follow all my real life stuff like cosplay, circus performing and fire performing at Instagram at Caesar Labert 7. And then of course I stream live every Sunday, Monday, Tuesday at twitch.tv slash Jedi underscore EJ. And of course I do want to remind you if you are interested for the following couple of weeks to see its popularity and if it gains, I will be doing a cube draft every Sunday during my stream. All you have to do is tune in and be able to have the stream open as well as Warcry, Eternal Warcry to make your deck join my discord join the cube looking for group channel and yeah we just draft decks and battle it out against each other so i definitely do encourage you guys to follow that if you can of course once again support the rest of the eternal community so podcasts like the misplay farming eternal eternal struggle all those things definitely follow everyone on youtube there's various people like loco pojo and uh Ilion that all post great videos i know cassandra is about to start posting videos as well so definitely check them out, support them, support the community, uptick the Reddit posts, share the Twitters, all that good stuff, because that helps spread the word to this great game of ours and makes it more productive as well as beneficial to the company, which means they'll probably invest more time and effort into it. But once again, that's all I got, guys. I am Jedi, aka Caesar the Crowd Pleaser with Eternal Journey. Thank you guys so, so much for tuning in. And until next time, happy gaming.